All right, good morning. Thank you very much to all of you for coming out today. Um, as we say often, and we're going to say a lot today, uh, thank you very much for all of the time that you give to CPA. Um, this is an important part of our um, year, experience and training, piece of tools, um, a refresher for some of you, and an uh, intro for some of you. Um, it's great to see the number of people we have here today. Uh, I think we've actually packed it out. And uh, it seems like this year we have more new recruits than ever. Um, so that's great to see. I um, appreciate all of you that um, we will talk about a little bit later, kind of refer a friend. Uh, it seems like all of the new rules officials are coming to us from uh, different, a, a current rules official. Uh, and that's, that's our best uh, recruiting tool and uh, seems to work the best. So I appreciate all of you taking care of that for us. Um, so I will get ready to hand it over to Jay Roberts. Um, as we started last year, I uh, got the USDA team to help us with the rules of golf presentation part of it. Um, so we have Jay here, who is a, a North Carolina um, uh, representative, I guess, for the USDA uh, before they all moved down here. Uh, but Jay, as you probably have seen, has done an awesome job with the social media, uh, videos, and kind of a, a newer, younger approach to the rules, and uh, done an awesome job presenting those. Um, we use the slides and, uh, and videos all the time now as well. I'm sure you see it all the time. Um, we had Jay doing the rules this morning. Um, very much appreciate him um, coming out. A couple real quick announcements. Um, if you, we'll have a couple breaks in, in throughout the presentation. Uh, restrooms are down that way past the Hall of Fame and then one back up that way um, towards the Ryder Cup bar. Um, but keep your questions as much as you can to whenever he has those kind of question breaks. Um, but again, appreciate you being here. Thank you very much to Jay, and I'll hand it over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Chris. Uh, appreciate that. Very excited to be here. Uh, not only because it's Pinehurst, but uh, you know, this is my hometown. I mean, not Pinehurst exactly, but I'm local. Uh, I've played many TJ events throughout the years. I plan to play in as many as I can in the years to come. Um, just had a little baby girl. Uh, he's three months now, so we'll see. <laughs> what, do you sell, what do you sell in your club? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thrilled to be here, uh, and I uh, think we've got uh, some good material to share today with you. So, um, before we jump in, uh, I thought it'd be a little fun uh, to start off with just a couple of rules trivia questions, a little something to get the juices flowing in the brain. Now, you may have Caught a glimpse of this. Uh, we were trying to work out the uh, computer situation here, but um, I want to throw this out. So, in the definition of line of play, and when we apply a rule that involves the line of play, it, it includes a reasonable distance on either side of that line. But in what situation does it not include that reasonable distance? And shout it out, doesn't matter. Penalty area. TIO. Penalty area. TIO. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Standing on or across the line. Now bring this up because uh, someone actually asked me this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and my mind immediately went to some pretty obscure places. Like, when are we not using this? But in actuality, it, it, it really involves one of the most basic principles in golf, and that's making a stroke. You know, so in Rule 10, we learn about what a stroke is and how we make a stroke. There are certain things that we're allowed and not allowed to do. One of those things that we're not allowed to do is deliberately place our foot either on or across that line when we're making a stroke. So here in this in this picture here, you know, I'm deliberately standing on either side of that line when I make a stroke, and, and that's just not allowed. Uh, now, when you're on the putting green, for example, and you've got line of play interference with an abnormal course condition, we're, we're normally going to give you that reasonable distance on either side. So you're going to find that near the point of complete relief, which is where it, the abnormal force condition no longer interferes with your line, but we're going to give you a little buffer room just to make it equitable for your next stroke. But, um, you know, you think about a situation where maybe you've got a tree 
and you're you got to squeeze in there really tight you're basically playing a vertical shot with the shaft and you're standing very close to that ball well if the reasonable distance was factored in there then we get into situations where you know you could be considered standing on that line and then the, the rule would be governing basically how far away or how close you can stand to that ball and that's really not what it's meant to do so when making a stroke, uh, the only rule where that reasonable distance is not is not a, is not a factor in the line of play. So uh, there's there's the first one. Outside of relief situations, all right, we're not taking relief, but when would a player be allowed to move their ball that's in play without penalty? Lift it, touch it, put it in a new place, ball in the play with no people. Damage ball. So I, I think I heard it, uh, but it's when your ball is in play in the team area. So this is one of those really interesting uh, situations here. I, I think I've got um, so the teeing area is one of the five defined areas of the golf course. Um, there's a lot of special privileges that we have in the teeing area, literally because the ball is not in play yet. But uh, in some situations, I wish we could play this video here, but in some situations, you might actually have a ball in play while still in the teeing area. In this particular example, I have uh, top this ball so horrendously <laughs> that it popped straight up and came down and, it, and it's in play in the teeing area. And when your ball is in play in the teeing area, whether it's because it hasn't left the teeing area or it's left and it's, and it's returned or you've taken the leap and you're in the teeing area, um, you're allowed to pick up that ball, move it anywhere you want in the teeing area. You can put it on a tee uh, without penalty. So um, pretty interesting, but, but fun situation there. <clears throat> all right we've all heard the expression you can take relief no closer to the hole but when are you allowed to take relief and go closer to the hole stroke and distance stroke and distance Bye. really no one really fair yeah well, we're kind of really fair. So, uh, so, drop it drop it dropping back, so. back of the line <laughs> So two unique situations, not necessarily unique, but unique in the sense that uh, there are times when taking relief in these situations can put you a lot closer to the hole. So you think about stroking distance, for example, you got 15 footers down a steep slope to a front flat with a false, false front right behind it, you hit it a little too hard, rolls down that false front. Now you've got a 60 yard wedge shot coming back. You can play that ball as it lies if you want to, but you can also take stroking distance, which might be the advantageous play there. We'll place the ball in the original spot on the putting green. You got another go at it. Still one stroke, but uh, we're getting closer to it. <laughs> Dropping zone. Now, another example. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about where committees should or are allowed to put a dropping zone, but the committee has a lot of flexibility and latitude as to where they put a dropping zone, how they want to set up the golf course. You know, you might have a situation where off the tee, you one dribble it into the water right in front of you. That dropping zone could be another 60, 70 yards up close to the hole. Sometimes it's even on the other side of the water, even closer to the hole. Uh, but another situation where we're taking relief closer to the hole. All right, I've got one more here. And if you've heard this before, uh, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> if you have heard it, you know the answer. You can raise your hand, but I, if, if you if you don't know, um, I'm I'm just curious what uh, what kind of answers we get here. But in what situation would a player take free relief by dropping on the putting? Green? Round under repair. Okay. Water. Out of bounds. Out of bounds. Out of bounds. Out of bounds. <laughs> Something to do with the penalty area? Red, red, red penalty. <laughs> Talking about free relief. Well, oh, free relief. Free relief. We might have to go deep into the tank on this one. 
Um, and also, you might not ever, it's likely you'll never experience this. This is, <laughs> this is very, very rare. <laughs> Are we throwing in the towel? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> okay. It's when your ball is on the putting green and you have interference with a wrong green. Wrong. Now, I, I, I want to I work through this here because uh, I, we share this with um, some very bright, very experienced referees, and for some reason, they just had trouble connecting dots here. So th there's no reason why this should spiral out of control in your, in your head. Everything you need to know <laughs> and do is right here in this rule. So first of all, we know we're dealing with two different areas of golf course because the committee has taken a double green and they've separated by local rule. So we have the putting green and we have the wrong green. The ball's on the putting green. We know we have interference with the wrong green because we're standing on it. All right, and there's times our ball is, is lying on it or it physically interferes with our, our stance or swing. We have interference. And when you have interference with the wrong green, you are required to take relief. And it is free relief, but that relief procedure involves dropping. Now, there is one caveat here, and it's very similar to something like taking relief from an abnormal course condition, but our, our, our reference point, it has to be in a specific spot, and it says right here that the reference point, your nearest point of complete relief, has to be in the same area of the course where your ball came to rest. Where your ball came to rest on the putting green, so we have to keep the ball on the putting green. So in this situation, we've got uh, a player who's going to find their nearest point of complete relief on the putting green. From there, they get one club length. So they have complete uh, elimination of interference with the wrong green. They're going to drop the ball on the putting green. You'll never see this. This is this is a once in a lifetime situation. Uh, this is actually a picture from last year's U.S. Senior Women's Amateur. Uh, we did have uh, a fair green, double green, separated into uh, two different greens by a local rule by those blue stakes right there. And uh, really, that ball can't come to rest. It might be hard to see there, but that, you know, the way the separation line was right on the slope, a ball's just naturally hardly ever going to land there. But, anyways, it's a fun, good question. And it will absolutely earn you a beer. A bar bet on the buttons. Yes. What was the strategy in in bifurcating the greens like that? Why not just say here's the green and the double green and rock and split them? Yeah, it, there's there's a couple of different things that that go into play there. I didn't work this championship, uh, so I wasn't part of that decision making process. But um, you know, so I can't really speak to, to to why they decided to do that. There, did anybody work this championship last year by chance? No. Um, you know, it it could be for a number a number of reasons, but. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, so the committee has a lot, of, lot, a lot of latitude to work with. But anyways, fun, fun little, little trivia question. Now, as we get into uh, the, the meat here of of today, uh, last year we conducted eighteen total championships. And at our appendages, we asked our referee to uh, document the rulings that they give. And so if a player calls a referee over and they assist with the ruling, uh, we'll ask our referees to, to document that. So we'll take the player's name, they'll write down the course, the round number, we'll do a brief description of the incident and the rule number that applies and the estimated ruling time that it took. Sounds like a lot, it's really not, not that big of a deal. Um, but uh, with that being said, across the entire 2023 season, how many total rulings do you think we have? And let's do this twice as right style. I don't go up. Lots of numbers. I'm very curious. 3,600. 3,600. Dollars. <laughs> 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30
So obviously the number of rounds varies by championship. So we get a stroke play, match play, and, and, and all that fun stuff. But uh, you know, if you consider each championship averaging five rounds, you know, we're looking at about 30 total rulings, 30 to 35 total rulings every single day. Now, of that 200, 2,657 rulings, what was the most common rule that came into play? Relief. Relief. What kind of relief? 16. Yeah, 16. So, rule 16. Uh, accounted for about 33% of all rulings the entire year. So when thinking about what made sense to cover today, what was the most practical thing to cover today, why not take a thorough dive into the rule that you are most likely going to encounter out on golf course? So we're going to take a, a good dive into uh, Rule 16, abnormal force conditions, including immovable obstructions. We've got dangerous animal conditions. We have a bed ball. Um, and just so you are aware, is anybody signed up for a workshop this year, a USGA workshop? Okay, good number of hands. So you might recognize this slide. This slide is what we use in our, in our full blown and live workshop. Um, and I will warn you that there, there's a lot of slides. There's a lot of information here. There's a lot of information in Rule 16 by itself. Uh, and the slide decks are really meant to go through every single line of the rule. Not really planning on doing that today, but um, if you find me sort of getting my bearings, that, that's why. But rule 16. So, from a chronological perspective in rules, the rule right before this, rule 15, we were dealing with movable objects that get in our way. So, we're talking about loose impediments, movable obstructions, and the relief procedure for those things is to simply leave the ball in place and move the object out of the way. Here in Rule 16, we're dealing with conditions that we can't move out of the way. So the rules give us a procedure to deal with that, and we're going to move our ball out of the way. Now, abnormal course conditions are things that the rules do not consider part of the challenge of playing the course. So when you have interference with them, we've got a way to get rid of them, to get out of the way of them so we can play and make our stroke. Now, I'm sure most of you probably experienced this, but abnormal course conditions, the term is such a widely misinterpreted term. I think a lot of people take the word abnormal and they apply it in the wrong context. You know, they, they see an area where there's grass everywhere, but there's that little dirt patch. Well, that's, no, that's not normal. It's supposed to be grass there. That must be abnormal. I must get free relief. <laughs> and that's just not what this term means. This term simply means any of these four conditions. When you look up the definition of abnormal course condition, that's the definition right there. It's referring to any one of these conditions. <laughs> now, each of these conditions are their own separate entity. They have their own definition, but we group them all together under this umbrella term, abnormal course conditions, because the rules treat them in the exact same way. The same relief procedure is used for every single one of these. And from a rule writing perspective, efficiency perspective, it's a lot easier to refer to one term than to all four every time we're, we're talking about these things. So to get an even better understanding of abnormal force conditions, we need to take a dive into each one of these conditions. So starting with animal hole. So an animal hole simply is any hole that's dug in the ground by an animal. Except for animals that are also defined as loose impediments. So here we have our first sort of example of how uh, uh, an object or a condition can have multiple statuses, can have multiple definitions. So uh, a loose impediment is going to be any animal, worm, insect, or similar animal that can be removed easily, right? So when, we, when we're talking about an animal hole, um, these little worm casts here in the bunker, yes, it is, it is a... <laughs> Uh, a, a hole that is inhabited by an animal, but if we start giving relief for all of these worm casts and other small you know, animal holes, it would get outrageous. Uh, so any hole that's dug an animal, that's not also an animal that's a loose impediment, is gonna be an animal hole. 
We have our animal definition here. Is any living member of the animal kingdom excluding us humans? Uh, but the animal whole is not limited to just the whole. There are a couple other things that fall into the definition of animal. So we have a loose material that the animal dug out of the hole. We've got any worn down track or trail that leads into that hole. And we also have any area of the ground that's pushed up or altered because of an animal digging in the ground. So um, in that last example there, you know, we don't actually need a hole. We don't need to see a hole. We can just have, you know, this raised up turf from, from a groundhog, gopher, whatever. These are all part of an animal. There is one other exception. So an animal hole is not going to include any animal footprints that are not a part of a tractor trail leading to that animal hole. So here we've got, you know, a deer or elk of some sort, you know, just transformed through the bunker. It's not part of any tractor trail that's leading into a hole. Your ball comes to rest in one of these, one of these footprints. That's pretty unfortunate. You know, play it as it lies or, or take penalty relief from playable ball, but uh, animal footprints are not part of animal. Uh, this was a, a little bit of a language update um, from for 2023. So we, we built in this sort of clarification, uh, which eliminated an interpretation that we had for animal hole. But uh, animal footprints are no, not part of animal. The next condition, we have ground under repair. Again, very similar to the term abnormal course condition in the sense that it's just widely misunderstood. You know, people will look at this and and, and many golfers might think, well, yeah, that's just, that's ground that's under repair. It's literally under repair. It's in the process of repairing. Isn't that ground under repair? Um, and it's, it's not. Uh, very simply, ground under repair is any part of the course that the committee wants to be ground under repair. It's as simple as that. It's any part of the that the committee wants to define the ground under repair. Now they can do it for a number of different reasons, for really any reason that they want to. Here we've got a picture from last year's senior women's open. Um, it's our good friend Ryan Farben there, uh, marking this area for ground under repair. Now it doesn't look uh, abnormal really in, in, in much way. You might be thinking, well, what's going on here? Yeah. We do have that little bear patch, but actually what was going on here is we had a lot of rain the night before and we had one of the, the bubbles um, underground. So there's a lot of water underneath the ground and when you stood on it, you know, it was kind of like sand on a waterbed. You know, and the ground was moving all over. So, you know, we decided, hey, look, if your ball comes to rest here, you can play it as it lies if you want, but you know, moving ground while playing a stroke is not part of the challenge. We're playing this golf out here, so we were we were willing to give free release there. Um, I'll point out that uh, otherwise, so you know, there's lots of different ways that we can mark ground under repair, um, but it doesn't have to be with lines or stakes. You know, it can be done verbally. Uh, it can be done through language written in a local rule. Um, it could be done just by sticking a sign out there on the golf course. So there's lots of ways to get there, but um, we'll get into a little bit more detail here. Now, when we have a defined area of ground under repair, there's a couple things that we need to know. So first of all, what does it include exactly? So it includes all of the ground inside that defined area, but it also includes any growing or natural object that's rooted inside of it. So here we have a great picture of what uh, a golf course might likely want to define as ground under repair. Um, flower beds are, are pretty common, other planted areas where you know we don't necessarily want golfers to play from. They can if they want to, but usually when you give a player a free relief option, they're typically going to take it. Um, but in terms of the things that are growing inside of us, all these bushes and, and plants and shrubs are part of the ground under repair. And, it, and that is inclusive if these plants were actually growing up and out over the edge of ground under repair. So we'll get into uh, we'll get into um, some markings here in, in a little bit. But if these, if, for for the purposes of this picture, the edge was defined by this uh, mulch liner, and if if there were some rooted bushes and and they grew up and out over. 
this area over here, that, that, that bush would still be part of ground under repair. So if you had interference from it, even though your ball wasn't in it, your, your swing might be hitting the bush, you'd still be entitled to, to free relief under ground under repair. You still have interference by ground under repair. We do have an exception though. <laughs> So if we've got, uh, say, a bush or a tree that is growing outside of it and it's underground or attached to the ground, this is not part of ground under repair. So if the committee, for whatever reason, decided to mark this area as ground under repair, we've got our white line here, and it included this tree. These roots right here that are outside of the defined area would not be part of ground under repair. So a very important distinction there. So not only do we have, uh, in, in terms of ground under repair, uh, what it includes when you define it, but there's also a couple of conditions where the committee doesn't have to define it at all. These are just automatically ground under repair. The committee doesn't have to mark it. They don't have to define it. They don't have to put a sign out there. Uh, these are automatically ground under repair from which a player would be allowed to have free relief. So number one, we've got three things. We've got any hole made by the committee or the maintenance staff in setting up the course or maintaining the course. So here at the bottom, we've obviously we, you know, we've got a lot of construction going on. There's a pretty big hole. It looks like to be in the middle of the fairway. The committee doesn't have to mark it. They don't have to put lines down. They don't have to put paint down. This is automatically ground under repair. So if you have interference, which we'll get into here in a little bit, um, that would be ground under repair. Any hole made made by the committee uh, in setting up the board. So perhaps not the best example, but um, it's an example that that people like to use. If that penalty area stake had been removed and the ball was in that hole, or you had interference with that hole, that's a hole made by the committee. You'd be allowed free relief from that. However, the ball would likely be in the penalty area. So you wouldn't get free relief to get it. <laughs> yeah, not the best thing. Uh, any material that's piled for later removal. So obviously our grounds crew, our committee does a lot to set up a golf course. And um, there's a lot of debris and other material that, that, that's required to, to set the golf course up. And, and something very common here is grass cuttings. Um, if there is material that's piled and with the intention that the committee is going to come back at some point in time to remove it, then we're going to consider that ground under repair. But another example of, of an object or a condition that having multiple statuses, even though this is ground under repair, this is still natural material, unattached material that is also considered loose impediments. So you can take free relief from ground under repair, or you could just move some of these grass clippings out of the way. They're also loose impediments. The key distinction here is that there has to be an intention for the committee to remove this material at some point in time. If there is a pile, but nobody's planning on coming back out to remove it, it's not ground under repair. So we get a lot of questions where, you know, a player <laughs> their ball into the woods, you know, off near a green, and they'll run into a, a pile of grass clippings. And you know, they ask, well, is would that be ground under repair? And it's probably unlikely that it would be. You know, it's not uncommon for you know maintenance guys to, to dump their grass clippings off to the side of the woods. They're not planning on removing it later, but they have removed it later. It's in the woods, it just happens to be in a pile. <laughs> so that's that's a really important uh, distinction there. It's got to be um, removed at a later point or or, or intended to. And then the third automatically considered ground under repair item is an animal habitat, like a bird's nest, where if the player were to make a stroke, they would likely damage it. And that's the, that's the purpose here. here. Um, one of the, uh, you may have seen recently a, a USGA post of, of Brian Wendell, I think he had interference with a uh, wooden bird house that was um, nailed to a tree and it interfered with his swing. And, uh, we were considering whether or not it could potentially fall into an animal habitat, which it is, it's an animal habitat, but it's under this provisio that the, the, the swing would damage it. And in that case, you know, it's kind of hard to damage a, a, a wooden birdhouse just on your back swing. That's a more kind of going down a rabbit hole there, but 
anyways, if you're going to potentially damage this animal habitat, then um, we need to protect the wildlife. You know, we play alongside wildlife, let's protect them. Um, we're going to get free release. Again, another call out here. Uh, we're not going to include uh, animal habitats from animals that are also loose and So worms, insects, they don't really have a lot of rights. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's a lot of different ways that we can mark or define ground under repair. Um, one of those is by stakes. And again, when determining what exactly is included when we're using stakes. This is very similar to how we do out of bounds, how we do penalty areas. But when stakes are used to define ground under repair, we're gonna look at the outside edge of those stakes, straight line from one to the other, and we're gonna use the point at ground level. So let's see if I can get a good angle here. So we've got obviously our ground under repair here marked by these stakes. We're gonna go and look at the outside edge of the stake at ground level. We're going to draw a straight line to the outside edge at ground level there to the other stake, and we'll repeat that process all the way around. Now, we do get a question, the question a lot like, why ground level? Why? What's the significance of that? Well, it's pretty uncommon to have uh, stakes as perfectly, nicely vertical as these. You know, they're wonky all the time. You see them bent over, they get bumps, people don't put them back. And if you think about it, you know, the point at ground level, no matter where the stake is, remains relatively constant. Whereas if we did something from the top and we had a wonky stake that's moving back and forth, you know, that that defined area is going to change drastically. So that's sort of a, a little insight as to the ground level portion of that. But we can also use lines. This is a lot more common. We mark ground under repair. So again, same scenario, same situation, but now we're using paint. And again, very similar to uh, how penalty area lines and, and OB lines are treated. But we're going to look, you know, we, this paint here has width to it. But still, we're going to look at the outside edge of that paint. So if any part of that ball is touching the paint on that, on that outside edge, that, that ball is going to be considered in the ground under repair. But as we looked at a little bit earlier, it can also be defined by physical features. And again, in this case, we're using this mulch liner as the as the defining mechanism here for this ground under repair. Uh, when using physical features, it's just important that we have a really clean, clear edge. We want to make it clear to the player whether or not they're in the ground under repair. What's what's in ground under repair? Do they have interference with ground under repair? So this is an example of a physical feature. Uh, but it's a it's a good one. It's got a clean edge. You can clearly see what's in and what's not. Another little update as far as the language for 2023. So we're just pointing out here that uh, if if ground under repair is being defined by uh, lines or physical features, stakes can still be used. Their purpose is is very simply just to show a player from a distance. Hey, look. Be aware, there's ground under repair over here. But the stake doesn't really have any other significant meaning. Um, and we're going to treat them as obstructions. So it's an artificial object. You can easily pull it out of the ground if it's in your way. No problem. You can move it out of the way. Um, and again, call out here, even if the ground under repair is defined by stakes, they're still obstructions. So as long as they're easily movable, you can move them. Um, unless for some reason the committee decides that they don't want you to move them. In which case they'll tell you, and therefore you should not move them if you do not want penalties. But uh, just a call out there that they are obstructions. All right, we're going to move into the third abnormal course condition, but we're going to take a little bit of a detour because now we're getting into the realm of objects, and it's it's we're, there's a lot going on here. Um, I'll do my best to try to keep it as clear as I can, but there's there's lots of different artificial objects that we experience out of the golf course, and understanding what they are is really important. <clears throat> so a boundary object. This is what's used to show or define out of bounds. So it can be stake, it can be a physical feature like these fences. Um, it's important to know what 
what's included and what's not included. I'm going to go back here. So fences are a very common uh, object that we use to define out of bounds. But when we're using a fence, the, the, the boundary objects um, includes the base and the post of that of that fence. So we have see that right there. That's important. That's part of it. It's not going to include any angled supports or guy wires. Um, that's a good example here. <coughs> Now here's where things get really interesting. Uh, so fences and gates are are very problematic in a lot of different ways because the boundary object does not include anything that's that you use to get through or over it, and this is where things get pretty interesting. So we have a uh, we have a fence here, and the committee has chosen to use it to show out of bounds. So this is the boundary object, but the boundary object does not include the gate. The gate is just an obstruction. So normally, if you had a if you if you had interference by this fence, okay, this is, okay. You have interference by this fence. You would not get free relief. If it was interfering with your swing, it would not get free relief. You don't get free relief from boundary objects. You know, think of like uh, out of bounds for um, NFL, actually, the great example of Super Bowl today. You know, the pylon sort of defines the, the end zone. But we don't go out there, we, we don't move the pylons. We can't move the pylons. They are what they are, they, they stick where they are. Uh, the same is true here with golf and, and boundary objects. So you wouldn't normally get relief. From this fence, but if your if your ball is in such a place where only the gate was interfering, it's an obstruction. You would get free relief, and depending on whether or not the gate is locked, it becomes a movable obstruction or an immovable obstruction. So, if the committee doesn't want to give free relief from this gate, they can then define it as integral. But again, any part of an integral object that you can move is also a movable obstruction. So even if it's integral, you can still move it, potentially get relief. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> we went down a really deep rabbit hole. And, uh, I don't know. Just for clarification. So if that gate was locked and the committee had made no statement about it, that lock gate would be considered an immovable obstruction? Immovable obstruction. Yeah. So there, the, the committee would then, if they didn't want to, they would have to just define that uh, movable or immovable. If it was movable, they could define it as immovable. But otherwise, if it's movable, okay. Now that movable obstruction, that gate then, you wouldn't get free relief. Because it could be outside the boundaries. Well, the, right. the, the gate is part of the boundary. So, and with a movable obstruction, you can remove any movable obstruction anywhere on anywhere on or off. So we can kind of still get a get a loophole there. <laughs> so important here, boundary objects are treated as immovable. Even if they are movable, again, we kind of go to that pylon uh, example. Um, they're meant to show where out of bounds is, and we don't want to. We don't want that line to be changing for players. So we, we treat them as immovable. You're not allowed to move them. If you do move them, if you do move a boundary object like one of these states here, um, and it improves one of the conditions affecting your stroke. We're going to deal with an eight dot one situation here. Players are going to get the general penalty for improving their cast when allowed conditions affecting the stroke. We have, yeah. So we we have three mutually exclusive situations going on here, and uh, we see our categories here. But I'm just going to keep this moving because this can get out of control pretty quickly. <laughs> but feel free to ask questions. Uh, feel free to throw them out there. But I think for the purposes of today. We want to get here to the meets. So immovable obstructions, one of the one of the abnormal force conditions here. 
an artificial object is considered an obstruction. All right. And there's really two things that it can fall into from a category standpoint. You can either move it easily and it becomes a movable obstruction, or you can, and it's an immovable obstruction. Here we're talking about uh, immovable obstructions. So uh, a great example would be our path. Yeah, so we're just gonna skip all that. Um, so any any obstruction that can't be moved with reasonable effort and without damaging the golf course. All right. So this car path, great example, we see them all the time. This is an immovable obstruction. Kind of touched on this a little while ago. Uh, so the committee can define any obstruction to be immovable, even if it meets the definition of movable. So we've got uh, the G fences here. Um, it might be pretty practical for a player to pick up one of these pilings and to move it because they can, it's easy, it's easy to do. But if the committee doesn't want them to do that, they can just define it. Hey, look, you're not allowed to move it, don't move it. It's immovable. Um, and we're going to leave it at that. All right, our last condition here, temporary water. So temporary water is any temporary accumulation of water that's on the surface of the ground and the very or one of the keys here is that it can't be in a penalty area right it can never be in a penalty area and it has to be visible that is the key the biggest key of all that is it has to be visible it has to be visible either before you take your stance or after you take your stance back here we had a great example obviously we've got um, a bunch of water that's not normally there, looks like to be in the middle of the fairway. We can see that water and it's not normally there. But there are a lot of situations where it's rained just enough. There's just that right amount of, uh, of water and ground where you don't see it right away. And when you take your stance, it starts to puddle up around your feet. That would also be considered temporary water as long as that water remains present. You can't draw water up and then have it immediately dis dissipate back to the ground. It has to remain present to, to be temporary water. Now, as referees, I'm sure you get, get this a lot. You know, players calling you over to, to hey, I think I've got temporary water here. And they're doing some Bulgarian <laughs> split squats. Like, look, I can get the. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the player taking their normal stance as they would for the stroke. If water comes up, then it's temporary water. We're not gonna be trying to draw the water out of the ground. It's also not enough for it to just be wet, muddy, soft. There are often times when you can actually hear water, like when you're walking, it's squishy, 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 but you have to see water in order for it to be temporary water. And it can't be momentarily visible. It needs to be, it needs to stay around your foot when you take that stance. We have a couple special, uh, a few special cases here. So dew and frost are not temporary water. Um, they're also not those impediments. They are, you know, just natural occurrences that happen on the golf course. We see them all the time. Snow and natural ice. Um, another special case here, and this is uh, one of the few times within the rules where the player sort of gets to choose if they want. So when snow and natural ice are on the ground, they can either treat that as uh, loose impediments, move them out of the way, or they can treat it as temporary water. But it has to be on the ground. If snow or natural ice was on a branch, for example, they could treat them as loose impediments, but if you know you've got swing interference and we've got an icy branch, you know that's not our back that we're going to be getting temporary water relief as the loose impediments. You can move them if you want, but temporary water has to be on the ground. Manufactured ice is just an obstruction. <laughs> Consider an artificial object because it's gone through a human manufacturing process to create it into the shape that it is. So if you have, you know, somebody spilled their drink on the golf course, you've got ice cubes in the way, just pick them up, move them out of the way. Movable instructions. Okay, so those are the four abnormal course conditions. 
And now we're going to move into uh, what we actually do to take relief. And one of the huge components uh, of this relief procedure is the nearest point of complete relief. So this is this is the estimated point that is closest to where the ball currently lies. To where, if you were to make a stroke at that location, you would have no more interference with the condition you're taking relief from. So here we've got a great example: players' balls on the car path. It's an immovable obstruction. They're entitled to free relief. To take free relief, we need to find the nearest point of complete relief. Now, what we're doing here is we're essentially having the player simulate what they would do, how they would play that shot if that obstruction wasn't there. So this requires the player to understand what club would I use? What line of play would I use? What stance would I use? And we, we package all that together and we have them find the spot that's closest to where the ball lies, where if they made a stroke from that position, the cart path would not interfere with them anymore. Now, there is no requirement to actually simulate, go through the simulation. Um, it is recommended though, uh, especially in a case like this where you know it could be close. The nearest point could be to the left, could be to the right. You know, that might not be a bad idea where the player actually goes to the motion of setting their club down on the ground and simulating what they would do to get an idea where that point is. But in this case, we've got, you know, the player has checked both sides and one side is obviously a lot closer to the ball than the other. That becomes their nearest point of complete relief. <laughs> And it's important to point out that the nearest point of complete relief does relate solely to the condition that you're taking relief from. There's going to be lots of times where you're taking relief from a car path, for example, and you've got temporary water where you're supposed to drop. So in a situation like that, we're going to ignore the temporary water. It doesn't exist yet. We're only going to focus on taking complete relief from the car path. If after taking relief from the car path, we now have interference from that temporary water, that's a new condition. We can go through the process again to take relief from that condition and uh, move forward as such, because it can make a difference. One other concept that I'm trying to uh, put together from a, from a video standpoint, in one of the one of the widely misunderstood uh, aspects of the nearest point of complete relief is that when people take relief, they're sort of under this impression that uh, I'm supposed to have a great shot after I take relief. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I've got, got a few ideas on how to do that, but uh, you no, know, that's not the case. The rules do not care about what obstacle you might face after you take relief. They only the rules only care about giving you complete relief from whatever you're taking relief from. So in, in this situation, you know, the player's ball was in the car path and his nearest points put them in this tree right here, which isn't ideal. Everybody would love to go left out in the open with a clear shot to the green, but the nearest point is just that. It's the nearest point, which is in 99.9% .9 of the time, just, just one point, and you don't get to choose where that is. So here again, we're pointing out that we're going to show up once at a time. You must take relief separately for each condition. Now, there is a, there can be a time where, again, we're, let's say we're dealing with a, a car path and temporary water. So we take relief from the car path. We now have interference with temporary water. So we take relief from the temporary water and it puts us back on the car path. And we, would ultimately just ping pong back and forth. We wouldn't really go anywhere. So in a situation like that, the rules will allow you to group them together, consider them one, and then take relief using a combination of, of what the uh, condition would be as a whole. 
but it's important that you actually go through the motion of dropping once and then taking relief from the other condition. That'd be a cool video too. <laughs> All right, so we have this concept of uh, the nearest point of complete relief. That's uh, that's what we're going to use as the basis here to actually take the relief procedure. So when we have interference, what exactly does that mean? And and it's very specific. It means it means one of two things: the ball is either touching it, or it's inner on it. In this uh, picture here, the ball is inside that defined area inside that ground under repair. Bottom picture: that ball is on the car path. It's touching the car path. Or it physically interferes with the area of your intended stance or area of an intended swing. Now, your stance is a little bit more than just the position of your feet, it's also the position of your entire body you would use to take the stroke. The area of intended swing, again, this is, we're talking about the full stroke here. So it's going to include the back swing, the down swing, the follow through. It's that entire area where a player would, would make a stroke. Move on the putting green, we've got a special condition here. So in addition to interference with live stance or swing, we're also going to get line of play. So when we get to the putting green, we're sort of at that final destination of, of completing a golf hole, and it requires a lot more precision. We've got to get a tiny ball into a tiny hole. And the intent, the, the, the intent of the stroke that you're <coughs> making on the putting green is to roll across the ground. So if you have uh, an abnormal course condition that's on your line of play where you're supposed to roll the ball, we're also going to consider that interference and, and give relief according to get into in just a minute. But the big, key, the, the big key here is that it's it's physical interference. All right, it can't just be close enough to distract you. You know, here in this picture, there is no physical interference. The ball is not touching it, it's not inner on it. It's not physically interfering with, with the stroke that this player would make, and it's not physically interfering with the position of their feet or their body. It's just close to them. It might look a little awkward. I think Sky Scheffler had a situation like this yesterday, um, but this is not interference. We're talking about physical interference. Now, there's a couple conditions uh, for when relief is allowed from an abnormal force condition. So first of all, the ball has to be on the course, anywhere on the course, and the abnormal course condition also has to be on the course. So in this situation, we've got a player who has uh, an immovable obstruction, this artificially surfaced road right here, that's interfering with their stance, but it's located off the course, it's, it's out of bounds. So the abnormal force condition has to be on the course. That's one of the conditions. The ball also can't be on a penalty area. So if you get your ball to a penalty area, like this player did here, again, we've got another immovable obstruction that's interfering with their swing. Because their ball's in the penalty area, they're not going to get relief. All right, so the, lo the location of the ball is uh, the most important thing here. When your ball is in a penalty area, you're not going to get the lead from having a fourth condition. And I think the easiest way for me to remember that is uh, temporary water. You know, oftentimes penalty areas include water, but you're not going to get free relief from water in a penalty area. It's one of those abnormal force conditions. So if your ball is in the penalty area, we're not going to get relief from abnormal force conditions. A good example here players in the penalty area, again, ball in the penalty area, and they have uh, interference with uh, an immovable obstruction, this car path. Even though the abnormal force condition is outside of the penalty area, we're still not going to get that free relief because the ball is in the penalty area. And so, ball is key. Position of the ball is key. When it's in the penalty area, no relief. When it's outside, you could potentially get relief. Now, I think it's worth pointing out this. Um, there's a, a local rule that was recently uh, published. Uh, we used it last year, 
but it's a it's a in our championship, but it allows for free relief for abnormal force conditions, specifically immovable obstructions, uh, when your ball is in the penalty area. And the idea behind this is as as course markers, as you go out to mark the course and you paint your lines and you put the thing where you want to, this is allowing the committee to put the lines where they need it. So do we have a lot of people that, that put paint down? You mark marking golf courses. So if, if you do, you might you, you might appreciate this. But uh, so as a as a marker, you'll go out there, you'll look at the hole, you'll evaluate the hole, you'll see exactly where you want to put the line, and you start painting. So you got your paint gun and you're walking and you're looking a few feet out ahead, you're keeping it real steady, and then all of a sudden you run into a sprinkler head that's right in your line or maybe a foot to the right. Now at that point, you're sort of in this situation, like what do I do? Because if I put the sprinkler head in the penalty area and the ball is in the penalty area, we're not gonna get relief from that. But we wanna give players relief for that in that sort of sort of situation. So you have two options here. You can swoop around to the left and, and make sure that it's not in the penalty area, or you can keep it in the penalty area. This local rule is allowing the committee to put the line where they want to without having to worry about that. So if you know you want to put the line right here, but you've got a row of sprinkler heads right here, it's not a big deal. The ball's in the penalty area. Uh, we can still get free relief from that. But again, this is for specific items. This is really meant for sprinkler heads, other small drain caps. Um, this bridge, for example, or this, uh, this fence um, was something that we provided free relief for in this particular situation, but just thought I'd throw that out there. We have another concept here uh, where a player would not be entitled to free relief if it is clearly unreasonable for them to play the shot as it lies. So we have an example here. This ball looks like it came to rest sort of in this, in this rock. And we'll imagine for this, uh, for this purpose that the player is standing on a car path. Now, when it is clearly unreasonable for a player to play the ball and they have interference with an abnormal force condition, relief is not going to be allowed. They need to be able to get the ball, the head on, the, they need to get the club on the ball. So this is a great example. Um, the abnormal course condition is not your get out of jail free card. And you've got to be able to put the club on the ball to make a stroke. So this would be clearly unreasonable and relief would be denied if they had interference with uh, an abnormal course condition. You also can't take a clearly unreasonable stance, stroke, use a line of play, to manipulate the situation in order to get relief. And we've got a, a good um, video here. So this is this is Y.E. Yang. This ball came to rest uh, in a really bad line, in some thick rub. And there's a sprinkler head close to his ball. So at this point, he, he's called over some help. And he's saying, hey, look, what if I play this left-handed? I'd be standing on the sprinkler head, wouldn't I get free relief? <laughs> so using a little bit of creativity here, but you know, that in this situation, that's just clearly unreasonable to do. The only reason why he would do that would be to get free relief, to escape the bad lie that he has. So in this case, um, relief was denied. This is how he would normally play it. And you know, after all that, he uh, doesn't really put a great shot on that. <laughs> yeah, he does. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah, so as a, as a referee out on the golf course, um, you, you might run into that. Uh, there's some great clarification to sort of expand on this concept, but you might have a player that, that says, hey, look, if I were to swing like this, I would have interference. You know, would I get free relief? And I think 
There's a couple of things that factor into it, but the, the main thing that, that at least that I think about is what would the player do? What would you do if that abnormal condition force condition wasn't there? So in that Y E Yang example, uh, if that sprinkler head wasn't there, I don't think that there's any chance ever that you would even consider playing a left-handed stroke there. So that's sort of uh, 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 a tactic to, to figuring out, you know, is what the player is trying to do clearly unreasonable. All right, so now that we know our abnormal course condition for the most part, we've, we've talked about this near point of complete relief concepts. Now we're going to actually take the lead. We're right at the point now where we can take the lead. And that relief procedure is going to turn, is, is going to be based on where the ball is on the golf course. So we have a few different areas of the golf course. Uh, there's five defined areas, actually. So we have uh, the peeing area is one. We have penalty areas is another. We have bunkers. We have the putting green. And we have the general area. So the general area will include everything that the four specific areas do not. Your trees, that's your woods, bushes, everything that's not covered by the four specific. So when our ball is in the general area, again, location of the ball is key, it's important, and we have interference with an abnormal course condition, we're going to take relief by dropping. Again, we're going to use our nearest point of complete relief. And that spot has to be in a general area. So for for uh, simplicity purposes, you know, you generally you're generally going to keep the ball in the same area of the course where it, where it was at rest when you take relief. Or a few exceptions. From that spot, we're going to get a one club length relief area that's no closer to the hole, keeping that relief area in the right area of the course. So. If we were to kind of play out this example here, we've got ground under repair. It's marked by a white line. Ball's inside. The ball is in the general area, and we're going to take the lead. So we're going to find the nearest point of complete relief, the spot that's closest to where the ball uh, lies, to where if we were to make a stroke, we would have no more interference with the ground under repair. From that point, we get a one club length relief area to drop in, no closer to the hole keeping that relief area all in the general area. Now, when we're in a bunker, we're going to use the same exact procedure. All right, so here we've got temporary water in a bunker, a ball in the bunker. We're going to take free relief from this temporary water. We're going to do the same exact thing, except we're going to keep it in the bunker. All right, the nearest point of complete relief needs to stay in the bunker. The relief area also needs to stay in the bunker. We're going to go through our <laughs> dropping procedure. We're going to drop in that relief area. And just calling out, it's the same exact thing. We're just going to keep, keep it all in the bunker. Now, that picture I just showed is a, is a good example. Uh, we, there, there may be situations where there might not be a nearest point of complete relief. Right? There's just not enough room to stay in the bunker to where we no longer are standing in it or swinging in that temporary water. So we have this concept called the point of maximum available relief. All right. So essentially what we're what we're doing is we are finding the spot uh, that gives us the least interference. All right. So going back to this picture here, All right, we've got the flag. You can see that there's just a little bit of a, a little bit of bunker left around the water, and there's no spot in that bunker where I can make a stroke and have complete, uh, have no interference at all. I'm, I'm going to be standing in it in some way. I'm going to be swinging in it in some way. So we're simply going to find the spot where we where at least interferes. We're going to look at it um, from the standpoint of, of a relative amount of interference. So the point of maximum available relief can either include uh, a situation where the temporary water changes the line or the stance in the swing. So for example, we might find a spot where the ball lies in less water than it originally did, and we're standing in more water now, or vice versa. 
right, we're just going to find a spot where we have the least interference and use that spot as our reference point. That's going to be our free relief option. Now, this also applies in the putting green, but it's extremely rare. Uh, it can happen, but it, it's extremely rare. Uh, so, as you can see, you know, we're, we're looking at a situation where uh, temporary water is around the entire hole. At that point, you know, I would hope that uh, the committee would be considering stopping play for, for the time being, because uh, at that point, you know, it's arguably unplayable. But again, we can do this on the putting green as well. Uh, and it's also important to point out that your uh, uh, nearest point can be <coughs> the green as well. So when your ball's in the bunker and you've got that interference, you can take that free relief procedure by, by dropping in the bunker. But we also have a penalty option if you don't like that. And you can get outside of the bunker for one penalty stroke. And you can... <laughs> I don't think you can ever go into a bunker and get out of it completely scot free. You, know, you hit your ball into your bunker, into the bunker, you're sort of penalized for, for that shot. It's going to cost you one stroke to get out. So, even though we're talking about a pre relief procedure, we're changing areas of the course. We're getting outside of that bunker for one penalty stroke. And we're going to use the back on the line for relief procedure. So, we'll use the spot of the ball. We'll draw a straight line from the hole through the ball. <laughs> And go back on that line as far as we want. Now we have to drop it directly on the line. That's what activates the relief area in, in, in this situation for this for this option. And the ball can roll up to one club length in any direction, even if that's closer to the hole. Now, if you have multiple areas of the course uh, potentially in this relief area, so say I go back. Um, to a spot where I'm about to drop in some grass, uh, but there's a bunker right to the right, and it's within that one club length. The ball has to stay in the same area of the course that it first touches when it drops. So if I drop it on that line and it drops in the rough and then it bounces into the bunker, it's in a different area of the course now. We would have to redrop that ball to keep it so that it stays in the general area. We'll go through our drop ring procedures there, drop, drop. No success will place in the spot where the ball first touched the ground on the second row. You can never take it closer to the hole. And not go closer to the hole. Yeah. Now we're back on the line. So the our reference point, our reference point there is going to be. We're using the ball, the, the, the ball to create that line. We can never drop closer to, than that ball. When you're in the bunker and there's water, like the picture you showed, like you can never leave it in the bunker and move it closer. Right, right. Yeah, so even though there was uh, some room to get in the bunker, uh, we're not going closer to the hole. So we're sort of limited by that, by that condition. We've got to say uh, no closer to the hole. Okay. Okay. Yes. So what about what's the most dangerous spot to retrieve my ball when I can take another spot in the bunker before I have slide the bunker? Can I break it? Say that one more time. Can I break the bunker after I walk in to retrieve my ball, take it to the bottom? It would make the penalty box. Am I allowed to re break the bunker before I play the next one? So is that is that the exception, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. So the is that right? I don't think that's right. I think it's only if you does it play it backwards? You can do that. You can rake it if you take it back on yeah, the line outside the circle. Yeah. You can rake it. You, 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 right, so you're, you yeah, go into the bunker to pick up your ball to take back on the line and leave outside. And you want to rake. The bunker before you can do anything you want in the bunker, you take no. it outside and drop it. No, because it, that's not here. the issue there at that point is that the the you're you're improving your line of good line. You can do that. You call it two seats. If you take the ball out of the bunker, even if it's on your line of play, even if you're improving the position, you can break it if you take it outside the bunker. Right? 
But you have to make a decision and take it out of the Oh, this, this is a good scenario. I'm not total. I don't think I'm totally there yet. <laughs> you think, Tom? I think you. I think your option is you don't want to mess up that bunker. You drop a new ball. Yeah. yeah. So you don't go. You know, once you, you create, if you create that damage yourself in the bunker and it's in your line of play, you're not allowed to go in there and and re, and and uh, the reason break I that bunker. The question, Jay, also is kind of related to. Uh, the ability to test the bumper if you want to cut through. And, and I thought about that. So, well, I'm just going to get my ball, you know, when, get my ball outside the bumper already. So, I want to cut through it and I walk into the bumper to test the sand, which I believe I'm allowed to do. I can't, I can't, can't re enter there. Break the bumper. So, I have to walk against the ground where I want to cut through. <laughs> so, it's kind of related to that. You know. If you take, if you look at the 12 2 C, no restrictions after ball is played after the bunker. After the ball is in a bunker's played and is outside the bunker, or player is taking or tends to take the leaf outside the bunker, the player may touch sand in the bunker without penalty, smooth sand in the bunker to care for the course without penalty under 8 1 A. You're set to go. You can do anything you want to do, even if it's on your line of play. As long as you take the leaf outside the bunker and you have to get it. If I don't want to get out of that's box, played. That's played, not played. Yeah. Played or, or released. It doesn't say that. Or so this is the good situation. I'm working for it to do this. Chris, you got any thoughts back there? Yeah, I think it's safe. Well, so three. There's no restrictions after ball is played out of the bunker, but after ball is have played outside of the floor. A player taken or tends to take the outside the bunker. The player may do the same in the bunker and stand for the floor. Yeah. Is that right? 12, 12, 12, 2, 3. Yeah, well, to be free. And it goes on to say this is true even if the ball comes to rest outside the bunker and the same the bunker is on the player's line of play. Yeah, so that's what I was getting at with the uh, playing it backwards. <laughs> I could do anything you want now. As long as the ball is outside the one. Take the film and put it in the Same thing if it gets it out of bounds. We'll just play again. Now, that's um, that's not entirely true. If you if you hit the ball from a bunker out of bounds. And you're going to take a trucking distance for leaf. Then you can smooth the sands there too. Yeah. All you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the leaf area you're going to drop in? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only time you can is if you hit the ball out of it and it falls back in. The <laughs> then you can. If it stays outside the bunker and you take stroke and distance in that leaf area, you can smooth it all you want, then you drop it there. Okay, we can come back to that. I just need to derail it. <laughs> I, I would call it a crowd work through situations like playing this, to be honest. I think it's great and, and incredibly helpful. Um, so, oh, you are? Oh, okay, cool. Well, then we'll let Chris do with that. <laughs> But it's a good scenario. Um, I guess I guess that'd be a situation where where uh, well well the overriding eight specifics over over generics. That's interesting. So I had a, a, a recently experienced another situation that was similar to that. But... Yeah, great great question. Good scenario. Um, yeah, Theo, I, I never, I never, uh, 
<laughs> mentioned this in the beginning, but please, like comments, questions, that's going to help this go a lot better for me. So uh, do not hesitate. Yes. I have a question. What do you call it, the uh, situation of the mark around the repair where the water goes under the side of the, I think you called it bubbling? Um, the play inside the place where it goes in the bunker and the wall moves, so it goes into the under repair area and the wall moves. Is that a penalty for moving the ball? Don't the ball mover, they still have the option to free the duty without a penalty. So the ball is in ground under repair in that bubble. Yes. And the ball moves. They go in and play the ball and they move it, taking their thing. Yeah, are you? So they're standing on and, and then they call it the ball move? Yes. And if the player's intending to play the ball as it lies and they cause the ball to move, it's going to be a one stroke penalty. They'll need to replace the ball. That's a good question. Well, that's interesting too because um, I don't think the ball would be moving at that point. I think we've got a, a clarification where what the ball is on is in relation to um, that moving on the ground. So like we have a situation where a ball is lodged in a, in a tree branch and it's blowing around. Well, the location of the ball on the branch isn't moving and the tree itself isn't moving in relation to the ground. So that ball's not moving. So that ball could be going like this up and down on the ground. I'll be moving. But for relief uh, on the putting green, we're going to take a very similar uh, relief procedure here. But again, we very rarely drop on the on the putting green. So if you're on the putting green and you have interference with an abnormal force condition, we can take that free relief. We're going to find the nearest point of complete relief where it's no longer interfering with our live stand, swing, or line of play on the putting green only. We're going to find that spot. We're just going to place it. Not going to drop it on the button here. We're just going to place it. And again, this is a relief procedure, so substitution would be allowed. You can change ball at any time you take relief. That's free relief or penalty relief. Um, but again, I want to point out that it's possible that your nearest point might not be on the putting green. So in this case, we've got a, a, a ball, temporary water is on our line. We want to take free relief. And our, our closest spot where that temporary water no longer interferes with our line of play is actually putting us on, on the fringe in the general area. So we're going from the putting green to the general area. Uh, we're still going to place the ball though. Again, our closest spot where the ball original lot originally, originally lay. It's no longer in our line of play. And then similar here, when we're dealing with the point of maximum available relief. Again, pretty rare. It's not going to happen very often. Now, that covers all the situations in which we actually find our ball. We know where our ball is, but there are times where we can still take free relief for abnormal force conditions, even if our ball is not found. So, I don't... Yeah, did anybody see that? See that golf ball? Let's see if we can do that again. You see it? So I did that on the first take, by the way. Uh, so uh, in, in, in this situation, as an example, so we've hit our ball and we've hit it into this shed. Or somebody <laughs> saw it go into the shed, we have knowledge or virtual certainty. And it's another standard that we use to determine what happens to the ball. It's a very high standard. It means you're at least 95% certain you know what happened to the ball or where the ball is. So as long as we reach that standard, uh, we can we can actually take free relief in this case. So we put our ball into this shed, but the door is locked. We can't go inside. We can't get it. But we know it's in there. We have knowledge or virtual certainty that it's in there. We can still take free relief. 
Again, this is all dependent on the area of the course that you're in. So again, we're not really changing anything here. If you're in the general area, stay in the general area, bunker, bunker, cluster penalty relief. Um, but our procedure here is going to be slightly different. Because since we don't know where the ball is, we, we need to do something. So we're actually going to use the estimated point for the ball last crossed the edge of that abnormal force condition. So again, this jet is an immovable structure, artificial object that we can't easily move. We're going to estimate the spot where a ball last crossed into it. And we're going to use that as the location of the ball and just pretend like that's where the ball is for the purposes of finding our nearest point of complete relief and, and, and taking and using this procedure. So here, you know, you're probably going to look at, um, let's take another look back at it, right? So you're probably going to, to consider the edge of the roof of this thing as, as where it last crossed. So we're going to imagine, imagine that our ball is right here, right outside the door, we're going to pretend that it's right there. And then from that point, we're going to then work out our nearest point of complete relief where this shed is no longer interfering with our live stances. And once we find that spot, we get a one twelve length relief there. Determine where it last crossed. A more uh, realistic example would be um, we just had a bunch of heavy rain and you split it right down the middle of the fairway. You see a big splash in temporary water. It's a huge puddle. We don't know exactly where it is in the puddle, but we know what's in there. We saw a splash. We know we're in an abnormal course condition. So in that case, we're going to estimate where the ball last crossed the edge of that temporary water. So we're going to come back to the outside edge where there's no longer temporary water. We're going to imagine that our ball is right there. And then from there, we're going to find the nearest point of complete relief and drop it in one level. It's important to point out that when you do this, you're locked into that ball, right? We have knowledge or virtual certainty of where the ball is. We've now elected to use this rule. We've taken our, our drop. That ball is in play, even if somebody finds it afterwards and within that three minute search time. So again, this, this happens quite a bit. Uh, we've, we've got, you know, as a slightly different example, the player hits their ball into a penalty area. We, 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 we didn't see it come to rest in there, but we have knowledge of virtual certainty. So players take lateral relief, they drop the ball, and then their buddy says, oh wait, it's, I see it, it's, it's up there, it's a little further up. Well, the player has knowledge of virtual certainty, they've played, they've taken their penalty relief under a rule, they're locked in, they're, that ball is in play. That other ball that their buddy found, that's now a wrong ball, can't be played. You're stuck with that, uh, with that ball that you put in play in, in that lateral relief situation. All right, we have a, a, another concept here, another uh, area um, or condition, rather, that's uh, it's called a no-play zone. Do you guys use a lot of no-play zones? Uh, kind of. It's really, I mean, it's all circumstantial, but not, not really. Yeah. CNCC. Yeah. So uh, a no-play zone is, is a special area of the course, right? It's basically an area that the committee has decided, hey, look, we do not want you playing from this area. So if you have interference with this area or if your ball is in it, it is going to be mandatory relief. Um, again, the relief procedure is going to be the exact same thing that we just talked about. Um, but, you know, looking for a good example. So I think this is at the Century. Right, flower beds or other decorative plantings are, are something that maybe might commonly sensitive areas to escape. Okay. Sure, yeah. The committee wanted to market as such. Absolutely, they can do it for any reason. They do it for a number of reasons. Player safety is one of them. Might be an area near a cliff where, hey, look, don't just don't go there. Just take the lead. The environmental areas. Um, environmentally sensitive areas is another one. We had we had one during the junior last year, the U.S. Uh, boys senior last year. 
Um, no play zones are either part of the, uh, an abnormal force condition or a penalty area. Uh, we'll, we'll get into penalty areas a, a little bit later today, but for this rule, uh, if a no play zone is part of an abnormal force condition, uh, it's going to be free relief. So we're going to take the lead based on where, where that, where that ball is, general area, bunker, putting green. So here we saw that ball in the flower bed. The committee had to find this area as a no play zone. All right. We're in the general area. So it is mandatory relief to take relief. We're going to find the nearest point of complete relief, drop it in one club length, no filter to the hole, keeping it in the general area. Is that free relief or penalty? Free relief. When the when the no play zone is part of the abnormal force condition, it's free relief. All right, this would also include uh, so here the ball was in it, the ball is actually in it. Uh, let's say that he was a little bit closer than where he is right now. And his follow through is um, maybe brushing some of the, the flowers in there that's in the no play zone. Again, we've got interference there with, with uh, swing. So free relief would be allowed, same, same procedure. Then we've got a, a good example here. They can happen on the putting green again, not, not very common. But here again, if the, if the committee decided to mark this area as a no play zone, right, our ball's not in it. But we have swing interference. Maybe our follow through is, is connecting with, with part of that no play zone. Um, we're going to take that through. All right. No play zones get pretty interesting when they're part of the penalty area uh, because we do have potential penalties involved, um, which I've got uh, which I've got queued up. Um, but uh, that's pretty much going to wrap it up for abnormal course conditions. Um, do we have any questions, comments, concerns? I, I just would like to see an email after the fact um, reconciling 12.2B3 versus 81D2 slash 3, which conflict each other. Yeah. I would like that too. <laughs> but I I will I will confirm that. Yeah. I think I'm I think I'm with you there. Yes, Mike. Uh, the reference the uh, twelve point two D three says specifically uh, smooth sand and buckle carefully forth without penalty under eight one a. It references that specifically without penalty. So it overrides 818. In the rule. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. This is 81D. A1D. This, I'm, I'm referencing A1D. Don't you said Mike? No, he said A1A. I'm referencing A1D. Apparently, got to go so the only rule that can apply in this case, which is an intense state of rule, and it's consistent with what everybody's been reading, it says you can go ahead and smooth it. It's part of the reason you're doing that is the penalty mm -hmm. There is no way to block it. You don't have any of those elements attached. Sure. Part of the reason is the only reason. We also have secondary Right. Yeah. How about that? For hundred. Oh, your ball's on the card pad. Here is one of the penalty areas. Great question. So your nearest point of yeah, complete relief can't be in a penalty area. We have to keep it in the general area. Assume the ball's in the general area. So you go the other direction. Potentially. I mean, it, it all comes down to how that penalty area is defined, what the line looks like. But in a situation that you're describing, if for the player that would normally go to the right, 
for this car path, for where the hole is, for the shot they're about to hit, it can't it can't be in the penalty area. So depending on if it, you know the line could swiggle, you might find a little bit more, you might find a spot a little bit further back, but at some point further back, you're gonna be getting too far away to where you're going back up even with the ball is your closest spot. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. One thing we try and do in our fourth parking setup is to take that line the right away the edge of the spot back. Mm -hmm. Kind of take one two or three feet over there to be excited to get down. It's one thing we try and do is make them on the right of the side of the path to make it more clear to see what it's about. But yeah, bring it down. Yeah, that's a good point. I've seen it. That's my other hand. Yeah. yeah. I Can you go back to the picture that. with the uh, lady? Was it the bunker with the water in the bunker? Yeah, she had she she had the water in the bunker. There was no room to the rear. This one, yes. Yeah. So the ball is there, and she's back in the grass. Where where would she take relief? Really? Well, what what's she doing here? Yeah. So there's the line. Yeah. Yeah. She wants to take free relief, right? So at that point, she needs to find a spot in the bunker. No closer to the hole, where she no longer has any interference with the water. And that's what I'm saying. If there's all, what if there was water all across the back, and she has to go forward? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah, right. so where would she take relief? Yeah. So, so, so it's a it's a bit of an unlucky, unfortunate situation for her, but she can't go closer no matter what. So she goes to another area of the course. Then she would she would have the opportunity to still take free relief by using the point of maximum available relief. So still keeping it in the bunker. Maybe she's just dealing with a little bit less water. And if she doesn't like that, then she has the option to come out of the bunker, but it's Again, still one stroke. stroke. Okay. Yeah. I just want to clear that. Okay. She's going to use the back of the line there. Mm -hmm. Um. And in so that case, what I'm saying though, she's forced to use the back of the line. Yes. So okay. Well, she's she, not. She's not necessarily forced. Okay. Yeah. She could drop the word. Yeah. Yeah. She could drop the word, yeah, yeah, word feed it. But my question too is, sometimes some of these bunkers have water all the way in them like that. Yeah. So that that's what I that was my question. So yeah. she could take back of the line, or she'll move back and then she, what would what would happen in that case? In, in which context? There's no. There's no. All the waters in the bottom. I've seen that. So, like no sand at all. Yeah, no sand, sand at all. all. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, dropping that this the same procedure, the same concepts are going to apply. At that point, we would hope though that you know the committee would intervene and just declare it ground under repair or something. Okay, that's my okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the point of maximum relief. You mentioned it could be a little deeper in the water, or your ball could be more in the water, or your feet would be in the water, perhaps. Is that a choice by the player? Yeah. They choose which poison they want. Give or take. One or the other. Uh, we have, uh, there's some more um, material left in rule 16. Uh, which includes dangerous animal conditions, which I do want to touch on. No, they're not very common, but I'm certainly down in South Carolina, some places in North Carolina, we can run into this. Did anybody have any dangerous animal conditions last year? Ants. Bees. Bees. Bees in the bunker. Gators. I love gators. <laughs> I won't mess with them, but I just I think it's so cool to play alongside dinosaurs. <laughs> so again, rule 16, we're outlining a few different conditions and scenarios where it's just not part of the town to play in the golf course, but uh, playing the game. And dangerous animals are one of them. You know, we're outside, it's an outdoor game. We're playing in natural habitats, it is uh, possible that we run into situations where an animal can cause us serious physical harm, and the rules have our backs on that. 
So what is a dangerous animal? We do outline some examples in the rules. This is a such as list. It's not completely inclusive of everything, uh, but we do cite some examples just to give you an idea of what we mean by dangerous animal. So we have venomous snakes, stinging bees, alligators, fire ants. But again, dangerous animals aren't limited to this list. It's important to point out that uh, this rule is not, um, well, actually, let's watch a smiley react to <laughs> this piece, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. No, it's not going to play. Um, yeah, it's um, so the, the relief procedure here is going to be pretty similar to what we just covered in dealing with abnormal course conditions. There is a slight twist to it, uh, and, and that's what we're going to really get into and, and what this means. But um, it's important to point out that this is, we're talking about animals, not other situations or conditions that could be perceived as dangerous. This poor guy, my goodness. Uh, what is that? A jump? Jump? Oh, call those jumping cactuses? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I've never seen them, but I guess if you get close to them, they like, literally jump out yeah. onto it. That's how it works. So yeah, unfortunately, cactuses, poison ivy, plant plants is a common question. Like you know, I'm pretty allergic to poison ivy and uh, if I, you know, get anywhere near it, it seems to just get it all over myself. But unfortunately, you know, we're, we're talking about dangerous animals here. Don't necessarily quote me on this, but I think the, the philosophy behind why we don't give relief for plants is uh, two reasons. So one, not everybody's affected by poison ivy. You know, some people can rub it all over them and, and be totally fine. Uh, so it doesn't affect everyone necessarily. And number two, um, it would then require the player to be able to accurately identify species of plants, which could get out of control pretty quickly. Yes. Do you have to identify a state? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so we do specifically say venomous snakes, but again, it really falls on the player to be able to identify a venomous snake. So I would say this, and I, and I posed this the other day, you know, if there was a situation where ball came to rest next to a snake, you know, a big giant black snake, and players like, and I don't, I don't know, I think that's poisonous. I, and they took relief, and they, they reported to the committee afterward, I think the committee would be justified in saying that's fine. You know, you did the right thing. We're not gonna we're not gonna put you in jeopardy. So although we do specify venomous, you know, there's, there's a lot of latitude there. Again, not all animals are listed. You know, there are certain animals that you know would fall under dangerous animal conditions. But yeah, it's a good good question. Question? Yes. So the instance I mentioned about uh, bees in a bunker, the situation I had was a relatively small bunker and a lot of bees. And there really wasn't anywhere in the bunker to get away from the bees. And unfortunately, I'm looking for clarification. The only other option was to take penalty. Penalty relief yeah. in the back of the line. Yeah. I was on yeah. the, no. Similar to uh, falls in a bunker with an alligator. Now you still have potentially a, a free relief option, but probably unlikely. So yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate roll of the dice there. Um, but penalty really would be, would be correct in, in that case. He wasn't very happy with that. I bet she wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alligator on the teeing area. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I think uh, at that point, the committee is going to jump in and, and probably get the maintenance guys out there with some. Um, some big sticks and maybe try to scare them away, but you, know, you need to start with the teeing area. Same is true with uh, with temporary water. You could have a teeing area that's completely covered, it's swampy. Um, hopefully, the committee might might do something, maybe create another tee box for that hole. But uh, yeah, we do, we need to get the ball started on the teeing area. So, um, you experienced that before? 
Yeah. Alligator on the T-Bone. Carolina Damage. Didn't run away. Did we get it away? Uh, eventually. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps a, a, an exception to unreasonably delaying play there for a little bit to handle the situation. And that, you know, this is one of the beauties about the rules of golf. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been studying, how long you've been doing it. You always learn something new. You always encounter a situation you never considered. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. It's unlike any other sport. And that's, that's, in my opinion, one of the beauties of it. Uh, but again, so with dangerous animal conditions, unlike other relief procedures where maybe you only get relief if you're in a certain area of the course, you know, this rule is not going to limit your safety based on where you are. So this isn't going to apply anywhere on the course. But depending on where you are, will just dictate where you're allowed to go. So general area, bunker, putting green. Uh, we do have a situation for uh, penalty area as well. But when with abnormal course conditions, we're usually finding the nearest point of complete relief. Similar concept here, but we're going to find that the, the nearest spot where the player is no longer at risk of this dangerous animal condition. Quite honestly, that point can vary. Uh, it can vary by player. Some people might feel a little bit more comfortable, a little bit closer. Some some might not as well. Um, but you know, this is this is part of the art of refereeing as well. You know, when you're out there, you're you're dealing with this situation. Um, we're going to lean a lot on the player on what they're comfortable with, but within reason. Obviously, we're not going to go 150 yards away. Um, so you, you got to use some judgment there. But it is a point that's going to vary. Now, when your ball is in a penalty area, uh, we're still going to offer potentially a, a free relief option. So you just have to keep the ball in the penalty area. So you'll still get uh, potentially a chance to get away from that animal to where it's safe, but we got to keep it in the penalty area. In some cases, like uh, the, the bees in the bunk there, that, that just might not be the case. There might not be a spot where you can go elsewhere in the penalty area to take relief from, from this alligator. In which case, the, the other option there, the, the ball's in the penalty area, so the player um, does have the option to take penalty relief in any of the options afforded in the penalty area, I mean, depending on if it's red or yellow, but they have that option as well. Now, we saw, um, okay. I'm just gonna use this picture here, so I think it's, I think it's best. So we, we've got a few different scenarios here. We obviously, we've got this alligator here and uh, we've got a body of water that's a penalty area by definition. So if our ball came to rest just off the screen to the right, let's say it's not in a penalty area and they have an apparent dangerous animal condition, right? they're, they're close to the alligator. The player would then be allowed to take a free relief. They're gonna take, find the nearest point where that alligator is no longer a threat keep it in the general area, and then from there, one club length drop, play on. If that ball came to rest on, on the picture here, right next to that alligator, now the ball is in the penalty area. So we still have uh, the potential option to take free relief. we got to keep it in the penalty area. We're likely going to go back further away. Uh, again, no closer to the hole. we got to keep it in the penalty area, and then take our relief from there. Uh, you know, might be other alligators in there as well. I mean, you got to keep your eyes pierced. Uh, but um, we have to keep it in the penalty area. If the player is like, you know, I'm just going to take my penalty area relief, no big deal. Uh, and let's say they choose lateral relief. So the ball last across the edge of the penalty area, just off screen to the right. There are two club lengths. It's still going to put them in a, in a dangerous animal condition. They would then be allowed uh, further relief. But one important distinction is that if your penalty area relief option, your lateral relief in this case, uh, still included interference with this dangerous animal condition, the rules are not going to require you to go through the motion of dropping your ball <laughs> next to the alligator and then take it completely. Yeah, so uh, that's that's nice of them. But so in that case, you'll you'll use the um, for, for reference points, just the, the point where the ball last crossed and you'll find the nearest point from there. But just, just wanted to point that out.
Um, and that's really, that's really it. I just wanted to cover cover that uh, and all the conditions that does does happen. And it's also part of uh, Rule 16 here. Now that wraps up 16. Um, we're going to segue into uh, penalty areas. All right, so another very common situation we find ourselves out on the golf course. Uh, a few key concepts here. We're going to talk about the options, what to do if the ball's not found, how do we take that relief. But we're going to start with what actually is a penalty area. So a penalty area by definition is one of two things. It's going to be any body of water. So we've got a bunch of examples here that's automatically a penalty area, but it can also be any area of the course that the committee wants to treat as a penalty area. So that bottom picture there, we, we're not dealing with any water, it's just a wooded area. And the committee may decide to mark that, define that as a penalty area. Perhaps it's just an area where playing as it lies isn't you know, really ideal, and the committee is going to give you an option to at least get out for one penalty stroke, but it could be any area that that committee wants to define. We do have two types. Uh, we have red and yellow. And this is going to dictate what options we have. Common question we get a lot, though, is... Uh, there's a lot of confusion about the nearest point of complete relief and, and penalty relief options. You know, the, the question comes, you know, can I, can I play a ball while I'm standing in a penalty area? Of course, you know, you can really stand almost anywhere you want on a golf course to play. Must be dealing with no play zones, which we'll get to in a little bit, but no problem at all. There's really no difference in how you're allowed to play a ball in a penalty area compared to just being in the fairway. You can ground your club, you can take practice swings to touch the ground, you can remove loose impediments. The only difference, and the reason why it's called a penalty area is because if you don't want to play it as it lies or you can't play it as it lies, it's going to cause one penalty stroke to get out of it. There are some really good diagrams in the rules that sort of outline uh, your relief options for penalty areas. But again, we have the same concept here uh, as we do with abnormal course conditions, that, that stroke and distance relief option. When, it, when it's known or virtually certain that the ball is in one and you take relief. So again, player hits their ball into the penalty area or they think it's in the penalty area, they have knowledge of virtual certainty that's in the penalty area, they use one of these penalty area relief options. That ball's in play now. The other balls, it's just the wrong ball. Hey, it's time to ball. Playable. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so when we get to the options, I'll outline by 17.1D. So again, there's two situations that can happen. You can either see the ball come to rest in a penalty area, or you have knowledge of virtual certainty that it's in the penalty area. Again, it's a very high standard. It's at least 95% certain that, it's, that came to rest in the penalty area. You're going to have a couple of options outlined here by this diagram. Right so you always have stroke and distance relief, right? You play a ball from where you last made your stroke, and depending on where you are, will determine how you put that ball in play. But in this case, we've got a player that's played from the teeing area, and they've hit the ball into the penalty area. One of their relief options is stroke and distance. So they can re-tee it anywhere they want in the teeing area. Ball's not in play until they make a stroke. So they have that option, that stroke and distance relief option. You also have back on the line. And this was a, a procedural change in, in 2023 with, with how it's done. But to take back on the line, you're going to find, first identify your reference point. All right, this is going to be the estimated spot where the ball last crossed into the penalty area. So you can see outlined there by point X. They're going to draw a straight line from the hole through that reference point as far back as they want and drop it directly on that line. 
And that drop on the line is going to create a relief area that's one club length in any direction, no closer to the hole. You can drop it in any area of the course that you want, except for the penalty area that you're taking relief from. Again, if there's multiple areas uh, in that potential relief area, it's got to stay in that area that the ball first touched the ground. Again, we have how we put balls into play depending on where we are for stroke and distance. So in the teeing area, you can replay from anywhere inside the teeing area, from a tee or not a tee, doesn't matter what you did the first time. Ball's not in play until you make that stroke. If your last stroke was made from the general area, a bunker, or a penalty area, then we're going to find that estimated point where the ball was last played from, and you get a one club length of the area to drop it. And then on the putting green, doesn't happen a whole lot, but it can. We're not going to drop, we're just going to place the ball on that estimated spot. And calling out the, the back of the line here, I think we've got to call out to that spot, that reference point. So we have to keep that spot between us and the hole. We're not going to go any closer to the hole than that spot. Straight line, drop it directly on the line. Anybody see the uh, back on the line mishap recently on TV? Yeah. Yeah. Hear about that? Yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> but yes, that was a that was a procedural error made by that player. So they identified the line correctly, and if I'm not mistaken, I think you I think you put a T down to mark that 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 spot on the line. And then he dropped it to the left of that line. And that's one of the components of this procedure is that you've got to drop it directly on the line. That's what creates the relief area. And since he didn't do that, he didn't drop it on the line. He never created a relief area. He's played from a wrong place. So again, this is, this is something we're going to use apply our reasonable judgment to it's very hard at, at some points in some cases to you know drop it directly on the line you know I hear um, a lot of arguments at times that you know a line is geometrically in, infinite or we're gonna use our reasonable judgment <laughs> Was the reason he was penalized because he put a T down to reference it and then intentionally no. dropped it off the line of the T? No, it, the penalty came from making a stroke after not yeah. dropping it on the line. Yeah, the, the T didn't really have anything to do with it. Um, and if he wouldn't have had a T in the ground referencing the exact line, he dropped it six inches to the side. I mean, it'll be that anal on a hundred yard shot. Yeah, I mean, so we're we're getting to the reasonable judgment realm. I think I think the putting the T in the ground was a bit incriminating. Um uh, basically confirmed that he was not dropping on the line. Um you wouldn't you wouldn't put the T down though to take this procedure because that T is effectively marking where you should drop it on the line. Now you can drop it in front or behind that T. Maybe if it's helpful for you to do that, you can, but there's certainly no requirement to put T in the ground. So without the T, he probably wouldn't have gotten penalized. Hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say. You know, I think it's, it, that's a situation where, you know, we, we've got cameras, we've got um, multiple vantage points to evaluate the situations. I think he made a lot of gestures of, you know, this is my line. I'm, I'm going like this. I think, you know, but it could come down to really talking to the player and asking them if, if there was any evidence to suggest that he didn't drop it on the line. You know, we're probably going to have a conversation with the player at that point. Fortunately, in this case, in terms of a rule application standpoint, he was he was very honest about the fact. Yeah, I, I didn't drop it on the line. I, I forgot to change. <laughs> A lot of uh, under underutilized uh, procedure, I would say. You know, a lot of people forget about this as an option. Um, it's why it's important to, to understand all of your options because sometimes back on the line is could be the most advantageous option.
We also have lateral reliefs for red only. So uh, with yellow penalty areas, we have the two options. We have to go from distance and back to the line. With red penalty areas, we're just going to add that third option. That's going to give you that lateral relief. Your ability to drop laterally within two club lengths of where the ball last crossed into the penalty area. So outlined here, our ball last crossed. We're going to take the estimated point where it last crossed, two club lengths, no closer to the hole, no closer than the reference point. We're going to drop that ball. There's the reference point. He, this player has estimated that last cross into the penalty area there. Now, again, last cross is another important component. Sometimes your ball can enter a penalty area, exit, and enter back in where the ball last crossed. So if this if, if that happened here, his reference point might be might be somewhere else. It's where it last crossed the surface. Oh, last slide, please. Uh, lateral relief on the opposite side of the penalty area is no longer permitted. It's no longer permitted under the rules. There is a local rule that I believe is on the CTA hard card, and uh, we need to go inside and have a mess. Go oh. B dot yeah. B two dot two. Yeah. yeah. I think I might have put that in here actually. So that's a good question. We'll get into that. But yes, no opposite side under under the rules. Here we get our two club lengths, drop our ball in the right way, and take our relief. We're not going to go close to the hole. This could be in any area of the course. Except for the penalty area that you're dropping in. But again, we still have to keep it in the same area where the ball first touched the ground. Maybe there's a bunker there. You need to keep it in the spot where it first touched the ground. There's a call out here for uh, a Rule 25 modifications for players with disabilities. We've expanded that club length to four. Uh, and, and the idea behind that is just to give the, the player equitable space and room to drop the ball uh, for players to use field mobility devices. So uh, this is actually not the... Are you going to cover um, this at all? No. I'm happy to dive into it. We're, we're going to cover the hard part, but not specifically. Okay. Would it be a value? Sure. To get into it? Um, give me give me one second here. Might not have it. So I'm not going to touch on this then because this is not it's not what you're using, right? Right. We we the first year we put it on the hard part because I could for us to do it, and then uh, you guys take them back to the, not a blanket statement too much of the on the hard part. They uh so it's course to course specific that we we do use it still every once in a while, but um. We left the out of bounds on there because that happens more often than than that specific specific. Yeah, for those years, they took it off the rules. Uh, the CGA permits that will use it if it's needed. Of course, of course, it's yeah. There's no longer an option. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a value to to bring it up. The illustration in the rules is uh oh on the internet. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll scratch that for now. So you can completely disregard the slide. <laughs> All right. Now, no play zones. We're back here on this topic. So we've covered it in 16 because no play zones can be part of an abnormal force condition or a penalty area. Uh, and again, I don't have a great, um, I don't have the picture for that, unfortunately, but no play zones. Again, any area of the court that the player, that they don't want players to play from. It could be for any reason. 
protect wildlife, preventing damage to planted areas, player safety, the number of reasons, but we just don't want you to play in from there. The relief is going to be mandatory. Now, how you take that relief is going to depend on the location of the ball. Um, I think we're getting to. So the way that no play zones read in the rules is actually a bit confusing, uh, at least in my opinion. But um, hopefully, I can I can break this down a little bit simpler. So here we have an example of a no play zone that's also part of a penalty area, and it's usually indicated uh, when they use stakes by using a different topper on top. So instead of having a you know normal red stake, we've got this green cap on top. This is to signify, look, this isn't a normal penalty area. This is a no play zone. So when your ball comes to rest in a no play zone, that's part of the penalty area. You're not allowed to play that lives. You're going to be required to take penalty area relief. And then we're going to get you all the way out of the penalty area. And we're going to use the procedures outlined under the penalty area rules. So we've got, you know, you can take your stroke and distance, lateral, if applicable, back in the line, if applicable. But it's going to cost you one stroke to get out. It's mandatory to get out one stroke. Now, there can be times where the no play zone is just a part of the penalty area. Maybe there's a section inside of the penalty area that's a no play zone. If your ball is in the penalty area, but you're not in the no play zone, ball is not in the no play zone, and you have interference with the no play zone. So again, similar to uh, the ground under repair, if I was swinging and I had swing interference with a portion of something that was in the no play zone, I'm required to take relief. But in that case, because the ball is not in the no play zone, it's going to be free relief, but we're staying in the penalty area. Okay. Again, you don't have a bunch of them, so that's helpful. We had a we had a great situation last year. I think the senior, the senior open where inside of the penalty area, um, there was a bunch of uh, brush, just really thick brush that surrounded a body of water. But leading into that body of water, there was liner. And we marked that, we find it as a no play zone because of a safety issue. If the player was standing on that liner, it was very slippery, they could slip into the, into the, into the penalty area. So if, the player had any interference with that liner, then they would get free release, but they'd have to stay in the penalty area. If their ball was in or on the liner or in the water, that was part of the no play zone, mandatory penalty relief. You get all the way out, but you're taking that one penalty stroke. No play zones are a bit finicky. Great example of this slide deck going into every line of the rule. We still have the same condition here. Talking about clearly unreasonable situations. The player just can't, can't get a club and ball. It's not going to either get out of jail for your card. I want to get this diagram right here. So likely scenario that you're may encounter out on the golf course. So what do we do if we decide to play the ball as it lies in the penalty area, but we're just not successful? Right, maybe we we go for the hero shot. We, we don't get it out of the penalty area. What what options do we have next? So here, T shot into the penalty area. We try to play it. We hit a tree. 
that never left the penalty area. It's in the penalty area still. So we can play the ball as it lies. But we also have a couple of options. We can take our stroke and distance for one penalty stroke. And we're going to stay within one club length of where we made that last stroke. That's keeping us in the penalty area. We still have our back on the line. We're going to use the spot where the ball last crossed into the penalty area. It doesn't matter how many strokes you made in the penalty area. That's still our reference point if we want to get out. And then we have the lateral relief, again, using that same reference point. Now, one, one nuance to add is, let's say we make our stroke from A, we hit it to B, it never left the penalty area, and we say to ourselves, let's try it, let's try that again. I think I can do that. And we take our stroke and distance relief, that's one penalty stroke, but the ball comes to rest in a pretty bad lie. And then we decide, yeah, this is not a good idea. I should not try this again. The player can then go on to take any of their other penalty area relief options, but they're going to get an, an, an additional penalty stroke. Right? That's the stroke for getting out of the penalty area. For one more stroke. We have a good, I hope this, I hope this plays right here. There we go. All right, so it's that Pebble Beach. Player hit the T-ball into the penalty area. They try to play it. From the penalty area, they hit it out of bounds. So how do we work through the options here? We can do stroke and distance again. We can do stroke and distance again. Keeping it in the penalty area. Two club lengths. Two club lengths. Yeah. Back on the line is probably not going to be an option here just because physically there isn't a back on the line. But if, if they do have it, they can use it. Here in this case, if I'm not mistaken, you hit the ball out of bounds. And he said, yeah, I've had enough of that. I'm not, I'm not going to try that again. And he goes straight to taking one of his relief options outside of the penalty area. Well, because his ball was out of bounds, you are required to take stroke and distance. That would have put him back in the penalty area. But he went straight to taking his, uh, in this case, I think, lateral relief. That might be back in the line. But either way, you're going to add two penalty strokes for that ball. Don't have to go through the motion of dropping it to take that stroke and distance relief. But we're going to add two there one for the out of bounds and then the other one to get out. So we're going to wrap things up today with uh, an inflatable ball. Playable ball can come in handy in a lot of different ways. It's our outs. If we're in a spot, we normally have to play the ball as a eyes, but we can choose not to. We've got this option in our pocket. So we'll wrap up today with uh, going over unplayable ball. <clears throat> A few key concepts today. It's always up to the player what is unplayable. Right, it is the player's sole decision to decide that a ball is unplayable, even if it's unplayable. We're going to learn about the parts of the course where you can use unplayable. We're going to go through the relief options, which are very similar to penalty area relief options. We have some limitations on the bunker, but we'll jump into 19. So. As we uh, as I said, the player is the only person that can declare the ball unplayable. And they can do it for any reason. Um, if, if another player says, what are you talking about? You can hit that, no problem. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter what they think. If the player wants it to be unplayable, they can, they can declare it unplayable. 
There's some limitations on when you can take an unplayable ball, though. All right, the ball has to be on the course, obviously. It could be anywhere on the course, except when it's in a penalty area. All right, we're not going to take unplayable ball relief when it's in a penalty area. We already have a rule that gives us some options. If we don't want to play the ball as it lies, we're just going to take penalty area relief. So unplayable would not be allowed in a penalty area. We're going to go through Rule 17. <clears throat> Got a couple of relief options here. Stroke and distance is always an option. We can always go back where we last played from. We've got back on the line again. We have lateral relief. And there's going to be a couple of conditions, a couple of nuances to using these procedures when we take a play of the ball. So here we have stroke and distance. We hit our ball into these bushes. We don't want to play it as it lies. We're going to call declare it unplayable. We can play from where we last made our stroke. And this, this can apply even if you don't find the ball. And that's going to be a, an important distinction here when we're in unplayable ball and the other options that we decide to use. You can also take back on the line or lateral relief. But you have to know the spot of the original ball because that is the reference point. Right? If you hit your ball into these bushes, for example, you have to be able to, uh, to find and identify it because you have to know the spot of the ball. We're going to use that spot to create our line. And if we don't know where our ball is, we can't use this option. So we do have to find our ball, know the location of the ball. All right, we're using a relief procedure here. So anytime we're taking the lead, we can use a different ball, substitute it for another ball. And here's our call out to what we do, how we put a ball in play, and we take stroke and distance. Depends on what area of the course that our last stroke was made from. Back in the line, again, similar procedure here, same procedure really, as uh, what we did in the penalty area relief rule. But we just have to know the spot of that ball. So we use the hole, draw a straight line through the spot of the unplayable ball, as far back as you want. We're going to drop it directly on that line. That's going to activate our relief area. And it can roll up to one club length in any direction, even closer to the hole. Not a problem. So similar to our reference point that we use for penalty area relief, right? We're not going to go closer than the spot of the unplayable ball. We got to keep that between us and the hole or back in the line. We can drop it in any area of the course. So it doesn't matter the spot of your unplayable ball. You can drop it in a penalty area. You can drop it in a bunker if you wanted to. You can drop it in any area of the course. But if there's multiple areas within that relief area, then we have to keep it in the same area that first touched the ground. So again, we've got a bunker just to the right on that line, and it lands in the rough, and it rolls into the bunker. That ball is now outside of the relief area. We have to redrop that again. Ball needs to stay in the in the general area, or at least the, the, the spot where first touch the ground. Lateral relief here, two club lengths from the spot of the unplayable ball, no closer to the hole. Reference point is the spot of the ball. Right, we got to know where the ball is because that's what we're using. That's that's how that's what dictates our relief area. So we need to know that that spot. And then we get into some fun stuff. <laughs> Has uh, anyone experienced this before, either as a golfer or referee? Yeah. 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 Speaking of palm tree. Palm tree. <laughs> yeah. So what do we do here? Identify. <laughs> I think I heard. It. Yeah. Okay. Identify first with the direction. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's the first condition. We've got to identify it as ours. Right? We can't just find a ball in a tree and assume that's ours. But we're going to take the spot directly underneath the ball on the ground. We're going to use that as our reference point. And then from there, we can take our lateral relief. Doesn't really change for back in the line. It's still a straight line, no matter where you put the line. Still use back in the line here. Straight line between the ball and the hole. Go back as far as you want. But for here, we need to figure out a spot on the ground. We're going to use the spot directly underneath the ball. Just draw a straight line down. 
and that's going to form our relief area. We got a couple of limits with lateral relief, right? It can't be close to the hole. We know that. It can be in any area of the course. Again, more than one area is more than one area of the course is, is in that relief area. We got to keep it in the spot where it first touches the ground. Call out here for uh, a modification for players with disabilities, just like similarly, uh, penalty for relief, lateral relief. We expanded it from two to four. Same concept here, that lateral relief area is expanded to four. We want to give these players room for their mobility, real mobility devices. And we have our penalty statement here. So anytime we're lifting the ball and putting it in a different spot or putting it in play in a different spot, um, there's a chance that we get the ball in the wrong place. And if we play it from the wrong place, we're going to get the general penalty. Two strokes and stroke play, off the hole and match play. One other thing I want to add about um, playable ball that uh, is, is, is commonly misunderstood. So if you think about that ball that was in the bushes and the player decides to take lateral relief, so they get their two club lengths. Uh, again, taking unplayable ball relief does not guarantee you a good next shot. So there can be a time where you take your two club lengths lateral relief area and you, you, you have another unplayable ball. Right? This, this isn't guaranteeing you that you'll have a playable ball. If you take your lateral relief and drop it, you can take unplayable ball again, but you're going to add another penalty stroke for each time you use that option. So it's best to uh, figure out what options you have and decide on that option before you make any moves. We have a, a, um, a slight difference here uh, when the ball is in the bunker. So again, ball is in the bunker, it's touching sand inside the edge of the bunker, the ball's in the bunker, but it's a bad lie. It's fried, it's, it's, it's buried in the lip in the bunker. We want to take unplayable ball. Still one penalty stroke. You still have all the options that you have normally. The ball is in the general area. So you got back in the line, keeping it in the bunker. You have lateral relief, keeping it in the bunker. But we have an extra option. And that's to get outside of the bunker. Now it's going to cost you a little bit more because we're getting out of the bunker. Remember, you're not really ever going to get out of a bunker scot free. It's going to cost you something. That's the, that's the, uh, the, your penalty for hitting it there to begin with. But if you're not feeling so great about your bunker game, and you just want to get out entirely through unplayable ball relief, you know, we can get outside no problem, but it's going to be two penalty strokes. And same relief procedure, create that line, drop it on the line. Off here. Thank you all for everything you do. <laughs> Appreciate you guys more than you know. Uh, I've been using the Zello app for this year, so I've actually been able to communicate with my rules officials, which is something I love to do on the golf course. So uh, thank you all. We got thanked last night at our dinner. All the players of the year say how great the CJ does and uh, compliment the staff, but they, they don't realize that you guys are there too, uh, helping us. So we do appreciate everything you do for us. And uh, I already touched on Jay. Thanks, Jay, for coming. We appreciate that. So Rule 20 is uh, one of my favorite rules. It is a difficult one to kind of get through, but uh, it's one of my favorite ones because it covers our tails. So <laughs> we're going to cover uh, resolving rules issues during the round. If you want to, if you want to open up the book to Rule 20, I'm just going to read right down. Okay, so we're just going to go right down it. And uh, anything you have any questions about, let me know. So this presentation is going to cover what, what to do when seeking a ruling during a round, match play rules, assign what to do between agreements between opponents, request ruling for committee, playing two balls, it's not an option, and then stroke play rules, players do not have the right to decide issues between by agreement, nor do their parents. <laughs> or, playing two balls, or coaches, yeah, or coaches, uh, playing two balls when uncertain what to do, 
and how the committee decides what falls to count. And then rulings by a referee or by the committee, find the naked eye, which we have to do because we're not the USJ. And then when all rulings can and cannot be corrected or disqualifying a player after a match or competition is final. And then what to do when a situation is not covered by the rules. And the purpose of the rule 20 was that players should do when they have questions about the rules during round and what they should do, including procedures, which are different match play and stroke play, allowing the player to protect their right to get a ruling at a later time. The rule also covers the rule of rule referees who are authorized to decide questions of fact and apply the rules or rulings from a referee and a committee member are binding on all points. So again, we're going to rewrite down the rules here. So 20.1. 20.1a, players must avoid unreasonably delay. So players must not unreasonably delay play when seeking help when the rules, with the rules during a round. If a referee or committee member is not available in a reasonable time to help with the rules issue, the player must decide what to do and play on. The player may protect their rights by either A, asking for a ruling and match play, or by B, playing two, rule, uh, two balls, stroke play under rule 21.1c3. 21.1b rules issues in match play. We're going to decide issues by agreement. Ruling can be requested, must be made before the result of the match is final. What to do with the ruling request is made after the result is final. And again, no right to play two balls. So 20.1b deciding issues by agreement. During a round, the players in the match may agree on how to decide a rules issue. I don't love it. Well, I do love it, but. Some of you might not love it because you're sitting there watching when you're not assigned as a referee and they decide what to do, but the agreed outcome is conclusive, even if it turns out to have been wrong under the rules. So, oh yeah, I dropped two club lengths from the cart path on that last hole. That's right, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's right. That's how that's how I do it. Well, we all know that's wrong, but um, that was what they agreed on. And since they didn't know, so as long as the players did not know to agree to ignore any rule or penalty, then uh, they're off the hook. So. But if a referee is assigned to a match, and this is why uh, at our match plays, we, we, we will assign you as a referee, or we're very, uh, we tell you right off the bat, you're not assigned as a referee, just hang back, watch some golf, stay out of the way, or hey, you are going to referee this match. So when a referee is assigned to the match, the referee must rule on any issue that comes to their attention in time, and the players must follow that rule. So in absence of a referee, the players, if the players do not agree or have doubt about how the rules apply, so it doesn't always go how that picture says, oh yeah, that's right, that's what we're supposed to do. The player may request a ruling under 21.1b. So under that, ruling requested made before the match is final, when a player wants a referee or committee member to decide how to apply the rules to their own play or their opponent's play, the player may make a request for a ruling, so they may make a request for a ruling. If a referee or committee is not available a reasonable time, the player may make a request for a ruling. So I want a ruling on whether you fix that error, uh, fixing the aeration uh, on the green hole is a penalty on against you. So A is called B out that he was fixing the aeration holes. And you let him know. He said, notify the opponent that a later ruling would be sought. So you got to let them know right then. We'll go before you see all things. And when a referee becomes available, so if a player makes a request for a ruling before the result of the match is final, a ruling will be given only if the request is made in time. It means when the player becomes aware of the facts before either player starts the final hole of the match, and we say final hole of the match because the match could might be ended on 15. <coughs> and when the player becomes aware of the facts during and after the completion hole, so those are two times. So we're talking about before the completion of the match. When the player becomes aware of the facts, the ruling request must be made before either player makes a stroke to begin another hole. So this is before the end of the, uh, the final hole, so you can't make a request two holes later if you knew all the facts. So it all depends on when the player became aware of the facts. So when the player becomes aware of the facts during or after completion of the final hole of the match, the ruling request must be made before the result of the match is final. And then there's a couple of clarifications in there about they, you might have to send them back out on the course. 
they come in off 15 and then they have they have their quest. You got to send them back out if the uh, one player is correct. So the player does not make the request in this time. A ruling will not be given by a referee or the committee. And the result of the whole question will stand, even if the rules were applied the wrong way. Go back if the player requests a ruling about an earlier hole, a ruling will be given only if all three of these apply. So the opponent breached a rule, didn't tell the player the right number of strokes, or failed to tell the player about a penalty that they incurred. And then the request is based on the facts that the player was not aware of before either of them had made a stroke to begin the hole, the next to the begin the hole being played, or between holes, the hole just completed. And then after becoming aware of these facts, the player makes a request for a ruling in time. So you have to have all those three. A ruling request made after the result of the match is final. When a player makes a request for a ruling after the result of the match is final, the committee will give the player a ruling only if both of these apply. The request is based on facts that the player was not aware of before the result of the match is final. And then, or the opponent breached, given the wrong number of strokes, or failed to tell the player about penalty, tell their opponent about penalty, and knew of the breach before the result of the match is final. So we get these calls all the time. Member guests are our favorite phone calls to answer. <laughs> it's always after the facts, and it's always the like pro doesn't want to hear so. <laughs> but our favorite right there is there's no time limit on giving such a ruling. So now in, in match play, there's no right to play two balls. So players uncertain about their right procedure in match play is not allowed to play out ball the hole with two balls. That procedure only applies in stroke play. So just go between the players and match play. 20.1c rules issues in stroke play. So again, coaches, parents, they have no right to decide rules issues by agreement. Uh, I have seen one junior golfer ever pull out the rules book and I point to it. I was so happy about it. But <laughs> they, uh, a referee or committee is not available in a reasonable time to help with the rules issue. The players are encouraged to help each other in applying the rules, which sometimes isn't great, but but they have no right to decide a rules issue by agreement. And any such agreement they have, they may reach is not binding on any player, or referee, or committee. So a player should raise any rules issues with the committee before returning the scorecard. A lot of times you all will kind of tell us, to, uh, hey, this came up. So give us the heads up before they come into scoring. Sometimes we get it resolved before they get there, but they must, uh, they should raise the any rules issues to the committee. Players should protect other players in the competition. That's what stroke play is about, to protect the interests of all other players, not just the ones in their group. That's why you can't agree to it, because your group. If a player knows or believes that another player has breached or might have breached the rules, that the other player does not recognize or is ignoring this, the player should tell the other player, player, marker, referee, or the committee. <laughs> and this should be done promptly after the player becomes aware of the issue. That's one thing I get so mad about. I think a, a lot of uh, our staff gets mad about is she was doing it all day. Well, why didn't you say something the first time? <laughs> so it should be done promptly and no later than before the other player returns their scorecard. I wasn't just saying just as women do, men do it too. I mean, so. Good cover. If the player fails to do so, the committee may disqualify the player. So that player that sat there and watched it all day long could be disqualified if they knew that they were letting somebody do something all day long. Um, and it happened to be actually one time uh, when I was working on the Hooters store, guy was using slope on his range finder all day long and the other guy was letting him do it giving him his numbers on the par threes and then called him out on it later so, <laughs> so, so, got bad news for you. But, uh, so that's not really the spirit of the game and again that's why i like the usj rules they, they really want you to play in the spirit of the game so 21.1c three playing two balls with uncertain what to do player who's uncertain about the right procedure while playing a hole, may complete the hole with two balls without penalty. And I'm going to try to get through all this, so correct me if I stumble, but um, 
there's a lot, a lot of when we decide who what score counts. But the player must decide to play two balls after the uncertain situation arises and before making a stroke. The player should choose, should choose is underlined there, which ball will count if the rules allow the procedure used for that ball by announcing that choice to their marker or to another player before making a stroke. If the player does not choose in time, the ball played first is treated as the ball chosen by the ball. I've gotten an argument with Rusty and Stapler about that, but we'll just keep reading the rules the way they're written. So <laughs> the player must report the facts of the situation to the committee. So that's a must. Must is underlined there. They must tell us. And they must do it before returning the scorecard, even if the player scores the same with both balls. Which is my favorite when they score both. So it makes it easy. Otherwise, the player is disqualified if they fail to do so. If the player made a stroke before deciding to play a second ball, the rules do not apply at all. The score that counts is the score of the ball played before the player decided to play the second ball. But the player gets no penalty for playing the second ball. So can't hit a ball and say, you know what? Out of a bad, ugly, wet area, say, you know what? I think I actually deserve relief from this. <laughs> Step outside from a bad area, play a second ball, and then say, well, that's the one I want to count. No, you you played that ball before you had any, uh, ever let it arise. So. Second ball uh, played under this rule is not the same as a provisional ball. So here we go. Committee's decision on the score for the hole. This is when I always go to Maggie and Rusty. So. When a player plays two balls under, under this rule, the committee will decide the player's score for the hole in this way. The score with the ball chosen, whether by the player or by default, <laughs> counts if the rules allow the procedure used for that ball. If the rules do not allow the procedure used for that ball, the score with the other ball played counts. If the rules allow the procedure used for that other ball, so... If the rules do not allow for the procedures used for each of the two balls, the score of the ball chosen, whether by the player or default, counts. Unless there's a serious breach in playing that ball from the wrong place. In which case, the score with the other ball counts. So, I try to keep reading over these ones. If there's a serious breach in playing each ball from the wrong place, the player is disqualified. So, I hope that one never, never happened. All strokes with the ball that does not count, including strokes made and any penalty strokes solely for playing that ball, do not count the player's score for the ball. So that makes sense. So rules allow the procedure use. So under that, there's an internal definition. The rules allow the procedure use means either the original ball was played as it lies. So I think. You're always, other than no play zone, you're always allowed to play your ball as advised. And play was allowed from there. The ball that was played was put into play under the right procedure, in the right way, in the right place, under the rules. So you got to meet all those requirements. Okay. I know we're all getting hungry, so I'm trying to knock it out. But I do think it's important. When any questions on, on when to do that? And... And I've had scenarios, I always tell people, just play your balls and lies. I, I remember on the Hooters store one time, that guy wanted relief from something, and uh, he ended up hurting from a terrible lie. Uh, his ball was embedded in the penalty area is what it was, and uh, he played two balls and, and ended up, didn't matter because he hurting the one from the terrible lie. And I was like, well, why did you even play two balls? Man? Just play your balls and lies. 20.2, rulings made by referees. This is Great one. A referee is an official name by the committee to decide questions of fact and apply the rules. So you're all here to learn. We're hoping that you're making correct rulings out there. The referee may get the committee's help before making a ruling. If you're scared, call us on the radio. <laughs> a, ref a referee's ruling on the facts or how the rules apply must be followed by the player. And a player has no right to appeal a referee's ruling to the committee. But after a ruling has been made, the referee may get a second opinion from another referee or refer a ruling to the committee for review, but is not required to do so. A referee's decision is final. Sorry. So if the referee authorizes the player to breach a rule in error, the player will not be penalized. I want everybody to soak that in for a minute. It takes the pressure off you a little bit, okay? 
We do hold ourselves in CJ. We high standards. We want to get all of our rulings correct. We want you always to make a correct ruling out there. But everybody in here, I don't know if Karen's ever made a wrong ruling, but I bet everybody else in here has made a wrong ruling at some point, and it's going to happen. So it's okay. Uh, we got you covered here in Rule Twenty Dot Two A. So and the player luckily is off the hook, but for when a wrong ruling by referee or the committee will be corrected, so we can correct them. When there's no referee to give a ruling, or when the referee rules, the referee refers a ruling to the committee, the ruling will be given by the committee and the committee's ruling is final. If the committee cannot reach a decision, it may refer the issue to the rules of the golf committee whose decision is final. So that covers us from all the lawyers out there. <laughs> so wrong ruling, so this is what happens when you give a wrong ruling. So if we can, a wrong ruling, has occurred when a referee or committee has attempted to apply the rules but has done so incorrectly. So again, we've all done it. Applying a wrong penalty or failing to apply a penalty or applying a rule that does not apply or does not exist and or misinterpreting a rule and applying it incorrectly. If a ruling by a referee or committee is later found to be wrong, if the ruling will be corrected, the ruling will be corrected if possible. So one of those ones that we can always correct we like that. If it's too late to do so, the ruling stands. So if you tell somebody they can play from somewhere, and they do, and they play from there, we can't really go back and correct that. But if you tell somebody that's a three-stroke penalty, and it's only a two-stroke penalty, we can go back and tell them, no, that's only two-stroke. If a player takes an action in breach of a rule based on a reasonable understanding of a referee's or committee's instruction during a round, or while play is stopped under Rule 5.7a, there's no penalty, and the instruction is treated like a wrong ruling. So I had a, I covered my butt one time. A player on the Hooters score ran across and picked up his ball. I don't know what he was doing, but he thought he heard me say, "Pick up your ball because there's lightning. You're trying to get in." So um, I think you had to mark it at time. He picked it up and ran, came running. And I was like, "Well, you were you were acting under my instruction, so we're going to let you off the hook." So. C committee procedure section section six C. Um, if you really want to get into those rules of how we can save it. <laughs> administrative mistakes. So there's a procedural error in relation to the administration of competition. There's no limit for correcting such a mistake. So if we do wrong condition, something like that, we're going to correct that, even if the result of the match is final or the stroke play competition is closed. An administrative mistake is different from a wrong ruling. Examples of administrative mistakes, miscalculating the results of the tie and stroke play. So actually, uh, a couple years ago, high school state championship, I think it was in Ohio, they were using new software. Right? You might know that it added up their scores wrong. <laughs> well, not, not good. <laughs> Luckily, those coaches came through and found out. So interesting. Or miscalculating a handicap result. Luckily, I don't have to deal with this much anymore, but um, <laughs> You know, that's, that's something we need to fix. Or awarding a prize to the wrong player after failing to post the winner's score. We're going to fix that. We want to get it right. In these situations, the mistake should be corrected, and the result of the competition should be amended accordingly. Disqualifying players after a result of match play or competition is final. So match play, there's no time limit on disqualifying a player under Rule 1.2, serious misconduct, or 1.3, deliberately failing to apply a penalty. So if you're cheating on purpose, and this may be done even after the result of the match is final. And that's good. It's good for the OHJ. We don't want cheaters. Or when the committee will be given a ruling, when a request is made after the result is final. In stroke play, normally a penalty must not be added or corrected after stroke play competition is closed. So when the result becomes final in a way that's set by the committee, in stroke play qualifying, followed by match play when the players teed off to start their first match. So if we go from stroke play, we had a, you know, USP has a long night. They get their playoff done the next morning a lot of time before they go to match play. They kind of cover themselves here. Hey, we, we've started on the match play. But a player must be disqualified even after the competition is closed if they return a score for any hole lower than actually taken, even, even if the competition is closed, except the player is not disqualified if the reason for the lower score is the exclusion of one or more penalty strokes that they did not know about before the competition is closed. 
I think that happens sometimes with DJ tour. Kind of hear about things after the fact. Who knows what's going on with the tour? Um, also, if they knew before the competition had closed that they were in breach of any other rule without a penalty, with a penalty of disqualification. So if they knew it, we're still going to disqualify them. Or if they agreed with any player to ignore any rule or penalty, they knew apply. The committee may also disqualify a player under 1.2 after competition is closed. So we find out that this junior golfer was slamming gloves, breaking gloves, cussing, and we can still disqualify them after the competition is closed. Any switch uh, 20.3, any situation not covered by the rules should be decided by the committee, considering all the circumstances, treating the situation in a way that is reasonable, fair, and consistent with how similar situations are treated under the rules. So we try our best to treat them all the same. Man, what do you think, Chris? Well, <laughs> all right. Good job. Any questions? Any other? Uh, no questions for real. It's all in the standard rule point. That one. You got the key points, right? You can mess up and we'll cover you. <laughs> but we ask not. So, um, so real quick, we want to bring Jay back up. We have a quick little thank you present for him um, and give him a round of applause as well. I'd like to tell this story, but some of you might have been in there, but I did a rules of golf seminar online four or five years ago, and this guy kept asking questions. <laughs> this voice sounds familiar. I just, and he was asking good questions. I was like, he knows his stuff too. And now he's making videos for the USGA. It's good for daytime, but uh, he uh, he loved the rules like we do. And like I said earlier, I, Jay, I'm excited to have a player up there. Uh, of your caliber. I don't know if you all know how accomplished he is as a golfer, but um, he's a pretty good one. I think I've given a rule in one or twice, but he yeah. he questions us on the rules. He likes to, he likes to be smart with the rules. So we, we're excited, Jay. 